Aloha. Aloha. Good to see you all, and thank you for coming out today. Um, it's uh, one of these things that uh, we planned this for four months, and we were in the middle of you know the lowest COVID rates, and everything was looking good. And I don't know what's more dangerous today: the COVID or the large South swell that is taking. Um, uh, a hit on our attendance, but our um, Zoom numbers have swelled. And so we've got a lot of people on Zoom and we really appreciate you showing up. We always like to begin with this slide um, because we like to say um, cesspools uh, on or near the coast are like toilets on the beach. So this was a PSA we did and we just put some, cleaned up some old toilets, put them on the beach and had people come and sit down on them and explain what we were doing. They thought we were crazy, of course, um, but it makes for a good uh, PSA. And this is Waibanalo, where there are a lot of uh, cesspools. It's one of the priority areas. Um, but I want to thank you for coming today. Um, and we have a lot of people to, to thank. And I first want to thank our presenters. If you can see them on the back wall, we have uh, Elgin, Fuji Clean, Ridge to Reefs. Um, and then we have Biomass Controls, Cambrian and Cinderella. Um, two of these organizations we met, um, and you'll be hearing from each of them at the Gates Conference in Beijing two years ago. Um, but now we are um, kind of moving forward with uh, the, you know, the next uh, stage from that, and we'll talk about their progress that we've made. Um, but I also want to thank, we've got people that have flown in from across the country um, so we want to welcome uh, Water, Jim Mothersbaugh from Water Tectonics, if you can raise your hand. Um, and we've got Dennis Poma from ACSI. Dennis over here, if you can raise your hand. Also, just a brief round of applause. Dennis is sponsoring us today, and that's why we're able to hold this at the Pacific Club. So please give him a, a warm welcome. And I want to welcome you all here and those online. Um, Yoko tells me that there are tens of thousands of people out there watching. I'm not sure if that's an accurate assessment, um, but uh, wastewater has become very hot lately. Um, and so along with our, uh, our presenters um, who will introduce themselves, I also want to thank um, our funders, uh, Amy at Ulupona, who will be coming a little bit later, um, and Eric from Castle Foundation. I want to thank them. Um, for really uh, believing in our mission and what we do. Um, and then I'm just so lucky to have this incredible staff and volunteers um, and all of our partners. Um, another sponsor um, that has been with us working with Cambrian um, is Pacific Current. So I want to thank Scott and Justin, if you can raise your hand over here. Um, great partners. Um, and we're excited to have all of them here. So before we officially begin, um, should probably introduce myself. My name is Stuart Coleman, and I'm the executive director and co-founder of VI, which stands for Wastewater Alternatives and Innovations. And we'll introduce the rest of the staff in a moment. But uh, I wanted to um, start off with an Oli um, to get us in the mood. So if you can take a moment, um, be present, and we will let our board member, Mahina Paishan uh, Duarte, um, start us off with an holy. Thank you. Aloha mai kako. Uh, my name is Mahina Paishan Duart. I am a board member of one of my most favorite uh, nonprofits, new nonprofits, and that is Vai. Uh, I want to welcome all of you and thank all of you for making time. Uh, to attend the second annual Innovation in Sanitation Convening. I wish I was there with you folks um, at the Pacific Club. Uh, nonetheless, I want to make sure that um, not only my voice, but the voice of, of the First Peoples of this land of Hawaii um, was also represented and to help to hold space uh, for the important agenda that's a, um, in front of us today. So the mele or the chant that I'd like to offer um, is entitled Na Akua Mahi Ai. And really what this, uh, this chant is speaking about, it, it wants to acknowledge um, all of the natural cycles um, uh, that 
at, within our ecosystem uh, that help bring life, that help to sustain life uh, for all of humanity and for all of its inhabitants, flora and fauna. And so we all know that vai or fresh water is integral, is critical uh, to the life ways of, of all beings, um, human, animal, and plant. So I offer this to all of you. It was taught to me by Dr. Kalenu Uhiva. Uh, she received the air or um, um, the melodic format by uh, the late uh, Kumuhula Lena Ala Kalamahaini. Na ako mahi ai. If you could please take a moment to sit up in your seats. We're gonna take deep, three deep breaths together, cleansing breaths. We're gonna focus our attention on freshwater resources. Ekahi. Elua. Ekolu. E kane lo no na ku mahi ai ho olai ka aina a po ho ka ai a ulu kupu kupu a ulu la u po o ole a o kanui i a o ka ai a we kane ame lo no. Mama Uanua. Aloha. Aloha. Mahalo, Mahina, uh, for setting the stage and tone um, for our uh, convening today. Um, just a brief overview of the um, agenda so we know what's coming up. We're going to give you some updates and progress reports. Um, we have uh, brief technology presentations. And each one will be followed by a Q and A, and we really like people to jump in and get involved um, and ask questions, so that we, you know, we want to know your concerns and your questions because it helps us. Um, then we'll have a coffee break. We'll finish up the tech presentations. We start with kind of the individual wastewater systems, and then we go to the community scale ones. And then we're going to talk about some regulation reforms. This is super important because we have ninety thousand cesspools that we need to convert. And so we need to streamline that process, um, working with uh, DOH and, and other partners. Then we're going to have some poly policy recommendations for the coming legislation, legislative session. Uh, most of it will be at state level. Some will be at the county levels. And then we will have um, breakout discussions. And that's super important. We really want your input today because everyone here is not only involved with this issue in some way or another, but is committed to helping Hawaii find solutions to one of its biggest problems. This is a three to $4 billion problem for the state, but more importantly, it poses all kinds of health and, um, and environmental issues. Um, so we'll have these breakout discussions talking about finance policy um, and, and technological solutions. And then we'll have kind of closing remarks. And then the most important part of all, we will have networking, food, very good food from the Pacific Club, and drinks. Um, so just kind of practical matters. Uh, I would like to say we had one of our Cinderella incineration uh, toilets in one of the corners over here for you to try out or um, over here, but we don't. So the bathroom is right across here. The men's bathroom is right here. And then the women's bathroom is uh, in the lobby uh, across from the front desk. Um, I was going to tell you to look under your chair that one person was the lucky winner of a Cinderella incineration toilet, but we, we're not able to do that at this point. Um, so yes, now I will turn it over um, to Christina to kind of give an overview of uh, who we are and, and what we've been doing. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, my name is Christina Comfort. I'm the program manager with VI, and I'm just going to give a quick overview of our mission and what we do at VI. 
Um, so first of all, our mission is to reduce sewage pollution and restore healthy watersheds by providing innovative, affordable, and eco-friendly solutions to waste and wastewater management. We're really committed to helping uh, fix the cesspool problem here in Hawaii, and really we want to help homeowners and communities manage this difficult process. Um, converting cesspools and failing septic systems is uh, really expensive and daunting. And we're working to help um, everyone find systems that are affordable, efficient, and better for the environment um, with the goal of clean water for Hawaii. And BAI has uh, five pillars with which we carry out this mission. Um, these are innovative technology, uh, which you'll be hearing from many of our innovative tech partners here today at this convening. Um, financial resources, policy and advocacy to help streamline the process, um, outreach and education to educate the communities and um, also bring awareness to uh, innovative solutions to um, agencies in the state as well. And finally, pilot projects where we can uh, demonstrate how some of these innovative technologies work in pilot locations across the state. Uh, this is our team. So we have a really great and diverse team uh, with Vi, and uh, you guys have already met Stuart, um, who opened this morning, or this afternoon, sorry. Um, and our managing director, John Anner, is here today. Say hi, John. And uh, he flew in from New York, so we're really excited to have him here in person with us. Um, as I said, I'm Christina, I'm the program manager. My background is in water quality and oceanography. Um, Yoko Schneider is our project coordinator um, and lead wastewater engineer. And then we have Raquel, uh, Raquel Gilliland, who's our operations coordinator, um, manages volunteers, social media outreach, and um, she'll be taking off for graduate school. So we're happy to welcome Jackie Orsa to our team um, as the new operations coordinator. So what is the cesspool problem in, in Hawaii? I think a lot of, a lot of you guys um, in this meeting already know um, how much of a problem cesspools are for, for Hawaii and for our environment and public health here. Um, but just a quick review, uh, we have over 88,000 cesspools in the state that release over 53 million gallons uh, per day of sewage into the, into the ground. And much of this goes into the groundwater and um, ultimately to our surface waters, such as uh, sensitive streams, coral reefs, um, ocean waters where we swim and recreate. Just for comparison, um, some of you might remember the Waikiki sewage spill of 2006. Um, that was 48 million gallons for that um, whole catastrophic event and 53 million gallons per day are being released by cesspools. So that gives you a bit of a sense of scale of the problem. Um, Act 125 mandates that all of these cesspools must be upgraded by 2050. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is a really expensive and daunting process. Um, so we're working to help, um, help homeowners, help the state address this challenge. Uh, and again, this is probably something that most of you guys in this audience know already. Just a quick review, uh, difference between a cesspool and a septic tank. Um, a cesspool is basically just a hole in the ground where wastewater goes. There's no treatment. It basically just percolates into the ground. Um, a septic tank, has some treatment because the wastewater goes into a tank first and some of the solids are able to settle out. Um, but then the, uh, the liquid part of the wastewater goes to a leach field and there's really no reduction in, um, in for instance, the nutrient pollution. So at VI, we're looking to kind of leapfrog past the solution of converting cesspools to septic tanks and looking at innovative solutions. This map shows uh, the location of cesspools throughout the state of Hawaii, at least on the, on the four main islands. Um, there's also plenty of cesspools on Molokai. Um, these, uh, these cesspools are denoted by the brown dots. And then the yellow shaded areas are the priority areas, which are denoted by the um, Hawaii Department of Health as areas that are a high priority for conversion. And Basically, that means that they're either causing pollution or suspected to cause pollution to drinking water resources or coastal waters. And finally, the health and environmental hazards of sewage pollution. Um, on the public health side, this causes drinking water pollution, uh, which is a concern for everyone, especially in areas where um, folks get their water from um, more shallow wells. 
And then uh, pathogens in the sewage pollution, uh, any increase in pathogens in the water can lead to an increase in waterborne diseases when people contact that water. Uh, there's also contaminants of emerging concern, which are often found in household chemicals, products. Um, these, th these are things that may cause cancer or other types of long-term illnesses that we don't really know that much about, but we are finding um, more and more that there's lots of chemicals um, in the wastewater that have long-term effects on human and environmental health. Um, and on the environmental side, one thing that we really think about a lot in Hawaii is our coral reefs. So the nutrients that um, come from sewage pollution can fuel invasive algal overgrowth, and that can kill our, um, our corals that protect our shorelines and provide all the amazing biodiversity and um, fishing that people in Hawaii rely on. Um, and there's also links between sewage pollution with coral disease and reduced coral cover. So this is a really important problem on lots of levels, uh, human health, environmental health, um, preserving our reefs and the way of life in Hawaii. And uh, yeah, we're excited to share some of our updates and progress since the last convening. I'll hand it back to Stuart. Mahalo, Christina. Um, so since we were last, um, and some of you in this audience were here, um, last together, uh, as I mentioned, we had the first uh, innovations in sanitation convening two, about two years ago in October, um, and that was at the Pacific Hotel, and that was sponsored by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, and we had uh, had a connection with them at the, we went to the reinvented toilet expo um, in Beijing, which uh, I never ever thought I would be going and speaking at an event like that with that title. Um, but it was an amazing uh, event for me personally, because I realized that we've been using the basic same sanitation system for, you know, over 120 years. And there is, uh, you know, a, a lot of revolutionary thinking coming down the pike. And I think it's really exciting to see what's ahead um, and to find more innovative ways to do that. Um, and so we're still working with the Gates Foundation. They're excited because we've got um, two technologies that we you know, uh, discovered there um, uh, three years ago. And so we're working to try to you know, commercialize those. Um, and here are a couple of uh, successful pilot projects. The first one is with the Cinderella incineration toilet. And I gotta pause for a second because when I first heard those two words, incineration toilet. I was like, those are two words that should never go together. Um, and my friend always likes to joke, you know, fire in the hole. Um, but it's, you know, now that I've gotten to know the technology and we've seen these pilot projects, the first was at HIMB, Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology um, in uh, Kaneohe Bay. And, you know, here we had some of the top, you know, scientists in the state and they really liked it. Um, they were like, this is an important issue. We've seen what sewage can do to the Bay because um, prior to the Clean Water Act, the Bay was in a massive decline. Um, coral reef uh, cover was um, severely reduced. There was a lot of algal overgrowth um, and uh, declines in fish populations. And just when they fixed those systems and that out, you know, uh, sewage outfalls, the Bay, you know, within a decade or two, I was already going through a major recovery. So this is something that we can do in our lifetimes. We can see the progress that's made um, and we can reduce the you know, 88,000 gallons that leaches out every day. Um, the second pilot project uh, on the right is on the North Shore. And I wanna give a shout out to our distributor, um, Ryan Ward, who was supposed to be here today, but uh, he had to attend virtually. Um, and this is really um, exciting because both of these places, you know, when you do a pilot project, you want to make sure it goes right. And both of them have ordered second units. They liked it so much. So that's a really good sign. Um, and we're just uh, thrilled to be representing Cinderella here. And then what's really exciting is that uh, through UHC grants program, and I think Darren, Darren Lerner, the head of the program is online, we were able to get this brilliant wastewater engineer here, Yoko, um, who helped design this new system for using, replacing uh, regular toilets with incineration toilets in the home um, and then creating a great water recycling system. And we were able to win a Kauai Innovation Grant um, based on that. So we're in the process. We're gonna get one installed near Kokee um, on Kauai and uh, 
you know, just so you know, before what they were doing, if there are any people, uh, you know, who've done this online at DLNR, when they had these composting stations way, way, you know, in remote areas, they have to shovel that stuff out into, into steel drums, metal drums, and then they have to often bring in helicopters to pick them up and fly them over communities to, wait, you know, to get rid of the waste. Um, no one wants to do that one, and it's dangerous and it's super expensive. So when they heard about these incineration toilets, we've already got a number of government agencies that are gonna be using this. So that's part of this uh, program that we're really excited about and Yoko will tell you more about it. So we've also gotten, since that first convening, we've gotten a lot of uh, great recognition and set up a lot of collaborations. So just in the last um, year, we have uh, become, excuse me, let me go back one. Um, sorry, we, we started working um, with the Division of Aquatic Resources and they have a goal um, working with the Castle Foundation and many other groups to manage and protect 30% of Hawaii's coastline by 2030. Currently, we're only managing 6%. Um, and you can imagine the amount of, um, you know, land-based source pollution that comes down, the sedimentation, the stormwater, and the, the runoff from these cesspools um, has a huge impact on our, uh, our bays and our nearshore waters and our groundwater. So we, with, through Christina, who's got uh, you know, a decade of water quality experiment, uh, experience working with uh, UH and then also working with the Surfrider Foundation and collaborating with other groups across the state, um, we've got uh, just a lot of data that we need to start synthesizing and bringing together, building a network of these scientists and NGOs so that we can have consistent measurements across the state um, and parameters to, to measure that by. Um, and so we're working on their monitoring program and their protection and restoration um, with uh, DAR. So that's super exciting. Um, we've also been recognized um, locally here and then nationally and internationally and have set up collaborations. We're part of the um, DOH's cesspool conversion working group and a number of our members are online today. Um, we just had a meeting yesterday the, this group of people is about 18 people are tasked with trying to find solutions. How do we replace 88,000 cesspools in the next 30 years before the 2050 deadline? Um, and so we're doing recommendations on financing technology, outreach. Um, and so that's partly why you're here today. We wanna to hear your feedback. Um, and then we're also, we want a grant to work with um, Dig Deep that put together this Decentralized Wastewater Innovations. The acronym is DWI, which is an unfortunate acronym for those of you who you know, have uh, ever um, heard that term, driving while influenced. Um, and, uh, but it's an amazing group of people. We have, uh, we're only one of five groups nationally that were selected for this, uh, which was really special. And all of the groups deal with indigenous populations. So we have a, um, we're the group for Hawaii and the Pacific. There's an Alaska group. Um, there's a group re representing the Navajo Nation. There's a group representing the underserved communities in Alabama and the Black Belt, um, which many of you might've read about in New Yorker Magazine. And there've been a lot of publications just about, we have developing world conditions and the return of diseases that we eliminated decades and decades ago, hookworm, because there's open sewage outfalls. Um, so we're seeing a real kind of change in awareness, not only here in Hawaii, but across the country and around the world. And our last partner is Ocean Sewage Alliance. And we were one of the founding partners of this global network that's focused on ocean sewage pollution and doing education and outreach. And so I encourage you to look them up. They've got a really active social media and you can join newsletters, um, a great organization. Um, so we just, as part of the DWI cohort, uh, Christina, Yoko, and I just went to Stony Brook University in Long Island, New York. And um, Long Island is famous for many things, um, including the Long Island accent. Um, I, used, I grew up there as a kid during the summers. And so I would go clamming uh, in the bays there and it was just the best fishing, the best clamming. Um, that has kind of collapsed because they're, Long Island is the only place in the entire country that has more cesspools than Hawaii. 
Hawaii is still number one per capita for number of cesspools, uh, no ka'oi, um, but uh, that's something we're working actively to reduce. Um, and so basically what it is, is the nitrogen and the nutrients from all this runoff um, is going into these bays and it's just wreaking havoc um, on the marine life there. And it's been traced and proven to be, you know, tied to cesspools um, and failing septic systems. There they have, uh, I just talked to Chris Clapp of the Nature Conservancy over there. And um, we met with him, we were back and he said, you know, we are in the highest in the country for nitrogen levels in our drinking water. Um, and that is very dangerous. There've been studies that just came out, a Danish study um, that's linking rates, nitrogen in the water to um, some of the highest rates of colorectal cancer. Um, so this is a real health issue that we have to have to deal with. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, this is an upcountry Maui that have been already seen um, elevated levels of nitrogen in the, in the wells there in the monitoring. Um, so when I mentioned to them, I was like, you know, I'm going back to Hawaii and we're having this convening and I'm going to be talking to the media. Do you mind if I use Long Island as a cautionary tale, you know, thinking like, oh, they're not going to want that tourism board certainly isn't. Um, and they said, yeah, absolutely. Be sure to warn them start on this now. They waited 30 years until it got, you know, we had collapse in these industries that have been around for generations and generations. He's like, no, you have to start now. We want to work with you. So the good news is this. They are 10 years ahead of us, at least. They've done the outreach. They've done the difficult work like we're going to be doing here today, finding financial resources, looking at policies that need to change. And they've really done a good job so we can use their model and they are available to help us. Um, so that's really, you know, uh, I think something that's very promising. They've done water, you know, sales tax. Um, they've created all kinds of funds that we'll talk about a little bit later that are really just a great example of something we can use um, in our own outreach and our own efforts, um, which is really exciting. So now we're gonna jump in and get our technology presentations going, um, which are really excited. So I will pass the mic um to yoko mahalo thank you Stuart. um christina do you want to take over my seat with the uh, lady people thank you hey everybody um i'm yoko project coordinator for vi um thanks everybody for coming here in person putting on nice clothes um and everybody on zoom in their pajamas with their videos off appreciate it um <laughs> We're gonna get into the technology part now, really exciting. We have five technology presentations coming up, three before the coffee break, two after. The three before the break are about individual wastewater systems on the single family home scale. And the ones after are on the decentralized community size scale. Um, and each of these technology partners of ours are especially awesome because the left side here on the screen each of them are donating at least one system to a lucky homeowner in need. And the ones on the right are going above and beyond applying for grants to offset the first pilot system in the ground in Hawaii. So without further ado, I um, have to disappoint you. It's still gonna be me presenting the first one because unfortunately Elgin could not make it out uh, from the mainland here. But I wanna still say thank you to Jim King, the president, of Elgin and Scott Moore, the technical development lead for putting together the slide deck. And to make it even easier for me, they have made a YouTube video for the first third of this presentation. So enjoy. Elgin Corporation is celebrating 50 years of success after its founding in 1970 by World War II veteran Lieutenant Colonel Joe Glasser. Since its beginning, Elgin has led in the passive treatment and dispersal market. Its humble beginnings started with the perforated drainage system, PDS, and grew with the development of the GSF system. Elgin produces all of its products in Windsor, Connecticut. The geotextile sand filter 
GSF for short, is distributed from Australia to Europe with greatest use in the United States. The first installations in 1982, this product is versatile and proven. This treatment product is 100% passive in gravity dose designs. However, more complicated sites employ a pump for pump to gravity and pressure dose configurations. Designers enjoy the high flexibility of the system, capable of use in trenches, beds, and mounds, there is a system configuration that fits whether you find yourself on a sloping site or a site with a high water table. The GSF system is your tight lot high water table and poor soil solution. Due to the flexible design, tight lots become dream lots, high water tables become gentle sloping lots, and poor soils are just another soil when employing the Elgin GSF system. The system excels at intermittent use sites as there are no startup procedures needed for the product. The GSF module is comprised of cuspated core wrapped with a geotextile fabric. The module is designed in such a way to maximize the vertical surface area inside the product. The vertical surfaces inside the GSF module promote the growth and management of the biomat. As the system is dosed, whether through a toilet flush or the pump in the pump tank turning on, effluent flows down the distribution pipe into the GSF module. The effluent is then filtered through the GSF module before passing through to the surrounding sand. Each dose charges the module with effluent, raising the water inside. As the effluent passes through the geotextile fabric, the module backfills with air and a biomat forms on the fabric. The air promotes and facilitates the growth of aerobic bacteria, which eats away at the biomat. This management process helps promote the long life of the product. After the effluent enters the sand, it flows to the receiving soil in an unsaturated environment. That is to say, the sand pores above the receiving soil are not entirely filled with effluent, rather they are filled with pockets of air. This process provides treatment and dispersal in the same footprint. The Elgin team takes training very seriously. Even though the GSF system's design and installation are quite simple, Elgin and its partners provide multiple avenues to become a trained designer, installer, or regulator. We have three methods that we commonly use to include classroom training, on-site training, and virtual training. The Elgin team is founded on training. Since their military service days, they have trained, taught training, and designed training to help others learn. The team is led by Captain Jim King, Petty Officer First Class Eric Daniels, and Private First Class Scott Moore. Elgin's team is made of leaders, veterans who served, who now serve the on-site industry's needs. They will bring a training experience to you and your team on all topics from basic design and installation, commercial system design, or more complicated subjects. All you have to do is contact us at 800-444-1359 or on our website at www.elgin.com slash training dash request. All right. Thank you very much for viewing that together. Um, so now it's me again. Um, to expand on what Scott just taught us about the Elgin geotextile sand filter, which is, like he said, a sort of advanced type of leach field used for the dispersal of wastewater while it also treats the wastewater. Um, the great things about the GSF are that no startup period is required, meaning as soon as it's in the ground, the bacteria form that are needed and uh, the treatment can begin. It's great for intermittent use, meaning that vacation rentals or summer camps are no challenge for the GSF. 
and its ideal since it's modular for hard to reach spots where otherwise larger containers couldn't get to them. The Elgin product family is comprised of not only um, National Sanitation Foundation Standard 40 certified products, which means that biological activity and solids are reduced to a certain level, but also NSF Standard 245, which reduces nitrogen as well. And so let me introduce how they do it, or further introduce it. Um, you can see here is the NSF 40 version, which is extra shallow in design. Um, the effluent goes through the module, like Scott explained, into the primary treatment zone. Um, the primary treatment zone has increased the surface area that's available and has open air channels for the bacteria to receive oxygen. And the secondary treatment layer, which is the interface between the module and the system sand, which we'll get into a little bit more later, supports nitrification um, and prevents the compaction of the system and clogging, which are two of the most common failure mechanisms of leach fields. The NSF245 version adds a tertiary treatment zone made up of a carbon source. In most cases, this will be wood chips made out of local trees that are mixed with sand. And this combination allows for the bacteria that is needed for denitrification, meaning turning the um, nitrogen in the liquid form to the nitrogen in the gas form, which is harmless and goes straight to the air, which is already mostly nitrogen. Um, so that is the tertiary level here, providing NSF 245. Here's another photo of what a typical Elgin installation can look like. It can be a long trench, it can be a bed, it can be any, almost any shape you can imagine, as long as you can have a perforated pipe going over it. It uses Hawaii's standard treatment application rates, making the design very easy and uh, intuitive. And it can use gravity feed, in, feed, needing no electricity at all, no pumps, or it can do pump to gravity, pressure distribution, whatever vertical obstacles have to be overcome, it's all possible. And like I said, trenches, beds, mounted systems, everything's possible. The benefits of this are that the passive treatment provides for far less required maintenance, far less breaking um, points that can fail, um, and overall very desirable. Um, it can maximize the internal surface area, meaning that small footprint is needed. It has the strength essentially of a package plant, which would come in in a container, but this is way smaller, more modular. Easy maintenance, like Scott said, it's, it's all part of their instructions and um, can be used for multiple applications in terms of residential and commercial, can be used to retrofit existing systems or for new or for cesspool conversions. Other benefits are for sites that require pre-treatment because for example, high strength wastewater, this can work really well, can be used in high groundwater situations where a shallow bedrock is in existence, which is something we'll get into in a minute. Uh, poor soils because of the system sand that enables the possibility of uh, using this here, and soils that are rapidly permeable, too fast even, where the bacteria would otherwise not have a chance to treat. And uh, as promised here, the shallow bedrock, you can see the photo on the left, that is grass growing on basalt. There is no soil. It's um, in Kao on the Big Island. And we are lucky to work with a veteran. His name is Jarvis who won our giveaway in 2020, our Veterans Day giveaway. Um, thank you also to Dennis for donating his engineering services to that. That's really awesome. And um, he is receiving a septic tank and a Elgin system. And the system is going to be for his five bedroom home, um, including two bedrooms where he's gonna take care of his um, parents, which uh, is something we really wanna support. You can see Kao is part of a priority area as defined by the Department of Health. 9,300 cesspools are the orange dots there. So it's quite dense. Um, and we hope that this is the first of very, very many Elgin systems installed in that area. And this is basalt rock. So you wanna keep the system shallow, minimize um, expensive excavation and the Elgin system is really ideal for that. This is the system that we're gonna use. It's gonna be trenches, just to give you an idea of what the bird's eye view of it would look like. And to get more into the system sand, the sand is a washed concrete sand and it's produced by multiple local quarries here. One even produces a recycled material out of concrete from demolished buildings. 
Um, this sand, as I said earlier, provides more soil structure. It um, elevates the level of filtration and it provides for nitrification and the decreases in compaction, soil clogging and oxygen demand provide for a long lifespan. You see some pictures of the systems going in the ground. Here's a picture of the Elgin family. Um, most of them, if not all of them, veterans and um, really great people to work with. And uh, they have made the commitment that when approximately 500 systems of the Elgin um, variety are installed in Hawaii, they will produce an assembly plant here locally, producing jobs um, and reducing shipping rates by a lot. And the units that are produced here in Hawaii that will be produced in Hawaii will also be used in Australia. This is a company, uh, an example for us bringing somebody into Hawaii that is already well established in the rest of the world, hundreds of thousands of systems in the ground. So they are um, nothing new, but new to Hawaii. Thank you all very much. And we will move over to the Q&A section. So I think the way we'll do it is on Zoom, please put your questions in the chat and I'll hand this mic over to Christina so she can read it out if there are any. No, she can Okay, so um, I will uh, wait um, and see if in person anybody has a question for me and I can uh, pass the mic. So um, is, does this system have to be like a one-for-one -one system? I mean, um, type scale system to service, you know. Thank you. Um, most of the cases for this will be either one or two houses combining flow for five bedrooms or less, meaning that this is more on the residential scale. But um, since it provides a certain level, a higher level of effluent, it can be definitely used in community scale as well. Um, it will depend on um, cost factors, whether that is uh, feasible or not, but it's certainly both possible. But I will make the prognosis that 95% at least will be on um, individual household level. Thank you. I heard you correctly, this is cited. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. Oh, yeah, of course. The first question, too. Let's just go from here because we got to. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so the question was whether a septic tank is still needed with the Elgin system. And yes, that is correct. A septic tank is used to via gravity settle up the heavier particles and toilet paper and all that so that only the liquids move on to the Elgin system and the septic tank will have to be pumped um, just as much as a regular septic tank would every approximately every five years um yeah great question and is there a question in the zoom chat yeah um, questions from the zoom chat um would an anaerobic tank be able to be used, or would an advanced treatment tank still be needed to meet NSF 40 slash NSF 245? Thank you. Um, no, anaerobic, com completely run of the mill septic tank uh, will suffice. So it is, um, it is certified for NSF 40 and NSF 245 in combination with the standard septic tank of a thousand or a little bit larger than that gallons. And you know, what are the benefits, real quick, of NSF-40 and NSF-5? Yeah, NSF-40, again, is um, the removal of most biological activity and uh, solids. And then NSF-245 also decreases nitrogen. And we'll do the last question to Wes. Make sure to keep the mic close to your mouth. Here's, what's the estimate cost for your library? See, this is me, the engineer asking cost questions because he's not allowed to do that. Um, it is going to be a little bit more than a chambered leach field. Um, for this five bedroom system in uh, on the Big Island, the cost will be a little bit higher than average because of the excavation in the basalt rock that will be required. But um, we're assuming that this will be equal or maybe a little bit less than a system utilizing a standard leach field and an aerobic treatment unit, but it's very much case by case basis. 
Um, and uh, yeah, we'll talk more about the financial um, feasibilities later in the financial section. So thank you all very much. And I will pass it over to Dennis Poma and Richard Chiodini, if you could please make your way to the stage. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Great. Then move along. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Chiodini. I'm with Clearwater Solutions, and I am the distributor for Fuji Clean here in the state of Hawaii. Uh, I've been associated with advanced uh, uh, aerobic treatment systems here for approximately, well, since 2006. And I, uh, having represented a few different technologies, soon realized that what works on the mainland isn't particularly suited for what happens here in Hawaii as far as climate. Uh, metal uh, components in the tanks rust out literally uh, within a year, uh, mechanical and electrical motors, components, similar life. So uh, four years ago when Fuji Clean uh, approached me and said, uh, would you be interested in representing uh, Fuji Clean? Uh, I, I learned about the product and about the company and absolutely jumped in. And you'll know those reasons as we proceed. Next slide, please. Oh, I can do it here? Yeah, I just oh. uh, this one right here. Oh, okay, yeah. thank you. Sure. All right. So uh, Fuji, uh, uh, Fuji Clean is, uh, was founded in 1961 and it's uh, based in uh, Nagoya, Japan. That's where they have their main plant, but they have other plants uh, located in the vicinity as they fabricate every single component of their system, whether it be the fiber reinforced tank, the, the air blower, the uh, treatment uh, uh, media inside the tank, the rises and frames and covers. And that's how they control quality. Uh, as it says, there's over 500 employees. It's a very large company. The uh, USA operations, Fuji Clean USA, is uh, located in Brunswick, Maine. There's also a Fuji uh, Clean uh, Australia and a Fuji Clean Europe, which operates out of Germany. Uh, since 2000, uh, since uh, 1961, uh, they've installed well over two million. Uh, systems worldwide, and uh, approximately 50,000 units per year um, in the roughly five to seven years uh, operating as Fuji Clean USA, they've installed over 2,500 units, and here in uh, Hawaii last year, we had 20 units installed, and uh, this year uh, is, is, is going to be a very good year for us as, as well. In uh, May of 2021, uh, FujiClean was uh, featured in Newsweek International. This is an excellent article because the president uh, actually explains uh, the, the challenges they've had uh, operating in a COVID uh, environment, as well as trying to fend off uh, cheap imitations from Taiwan and, and China. Uh, the uh, Global Niche Top 100 is an award uh, offered uh, by the uh, Japanese uh, Ministry of, uh, of uh, Technology, and they uh, moved uh, or, or voted uh, Fuji in that top slot in 2020. The waste uh, uh, equipment uh, technology award uh, was, was offered to uh, Fuji in 2003 based on their uh, performance and innovation. Um, the little green box on, on the left is, is really interesting and it, it had to touch on what, what Stuart was saying. Suffolk County in New York uh, have installed hundreds of aerobic systems, many of them uh, Fuji Clean. And they were able to come up with a program of funding uh, to upgrade those with no out-of-pocket expense. That would be a fascinating thing to find out how they did that and maybe have application here. So here we are, uh, Clearwater Solutions. I'm 
based out of uh, Kailua Kona on the Big Island. My associate, Dennis, uh, is here in Oahu. And between the two of us, we market, we sell, we provide technical information. Um, we uh, actually uh, train, and that's a requirement of Fuji Clean. We have to train and certify installers and uh, service technicians. So we do have a team of trained service technicians and installers that help us throughout various islands. On the left is a brief uh, picture of what the system looks like. As I noted earlier, every component of that tank is man manufactured by Fuji Clean and it is it arrives at the site totally installed. There is nothing the installer has to do to the inside of that tank to get it operational. Every component, everything in there is, uh, is, is already uh, installed. There are uh, no metal parts. There are uh, no moving parts. There are air pumps. And we have an external blower that provides air to it. It's a linear blower. It is extremely uh, cost effective to, to operate. And some of those advantages that we've indicated uh, before, they have a huge install base. So they, they really know what they're doing at Fuji Clean. Um, a septic tank is not necessary uh, that to proceed the Fuji uh, Clean. Um, no moving parts, we mentioned. It has built-in equalization. Um, it does meet NSF 40 and NS uh, 245 standards, the two, three, four, and five bedroom systems. Um, that's the TN removal, the 70 plus percent. Um, there is phosphorus technology available. Uh, it has a very small footprint versus its competitors. It has a very low power use because of the linear blower. It's lightweight and it's easy to install. Um, you know, on, I just want to note on the back table, I have a flyer here of information that uh, would be very helpful for you to, it has every model that we, we sell, uh, all the way up to uh, 6,000 gallon per day for residential. Uh, meeting NSF uh, 40 and 245. It uh, shows the, the blower requirements for energy and the tank detail as far as physical requirements. So this whole table right here will give you everything you need to know about every single model. And the back is a very brief installation sketch on how it goes in the ground. Uh, Dennis is going to take care of the technical portion of, of the program, and I'll turn that over to him now. Are we switching out mics? Nope. Oh. Still on that oh, one. And then um, you can uh, just move forward with this. So go ahead and use that one. Good afternoon. I'd like to say, although the other engineer in here, one of the other engineers who is Yoko's mentor, he was our both of our first, he was an employee of us actually so we're proud to see him up here uh, being an engineer and taking reins on this uh, issue in Hawaii and all so um, it's glad to see that um, I'm there a lot of uh, I didn't know about Christine as part of her presentation so part of what's the problem is going to be a little bit redundant but really I could almost replace this we haven't really talked about the numbers so much and that is you could replace this slide with eighty eight thousand. And that is in year 2050. So think about that. Let's just round to that's 30 years away. I can tell you, because I do, I average probably right now close to 75 systems a year, design and installation of septic and aerobic systems. And one out of every four properties that I encounter easily are non-registered. So I, I probably even have two this week alone. Actually, I had one property with three unregistered cesspools on one property. So take that 88,000, it's really probably more like 100,000, 120,000 probably. So you divide 30 years over 100,000, that's 3,000 systems a year. Wes, how many systems do you do? Like about 100 a year, right or so? I do 75, 100 a year. All the engineers combined, and if you look at the numbers in the state, 
they're only averaging less than 200 a year. We've got a long way to go to get there, meaning we don't have enough engineers, we don't have enough installers. Almost all the installers we deal with, they're all actually close to age 70 and ready to retire, and they're all the good installers. So we're we're losing out on you know the the infrastructure to be able to put these systems in. Um, so really, you know, as, as Christina talked about the proximity, actually how I got into this business was probably about eight years ago is because I had a number of clients that had to put in systems and they were right on the ocean or they were within 50 feet of a surface water. If you look at the state guide, it says you're supposed to do an aerobic system or something that reduces the nitrogen. Well, septic doesn't reduce nitrogen. And I couldn't find a good aerobic system at the time. They just really weren't available. Um, Industrial Wastewater Technologies does have their CBT system and was familiar with it and used it. Um, but I was looking for my own, a different technology. So I got associated with a technology, not Fuji Clean, that's now defunct, um, no longer associated with it. And when that happened a few years ago, that's how I met Richard and was really, you know, was excited to jump into uh, taking over the dealership. Jensen used to have it here on Oahu. So I jumped at the opportunity to be able to provide a great product. And it really has turned into a great product and a reliable product for uh, homeowners and such. So Fuji Clean, we are in different than Elgin, which is passive. We're an active system. So we're not relying on the ground or the soil to do the treatment or a passive system uh, within the ground like Elgin to do the treatment. We are active. So we do have electricity needs. We have a blower. We need to uh, create within the tank and tank system the aerobic digestion process. Um, so you know, actually, I think one of the earlier questions was about like community based. If you look at Fuji Clean in Japan, it's really interesting um, type of system. When they use the Fuji Clean, but they don't use leach fields or seepage pits. They actually discharge to pipes that go direct to the surface water. So the neighborhoods ha all have their own ATUs. So they don't have a commercial system. They clean the water and then that clean water gets discharged under like an NPDS system. Um, permit system and it goes direct out to a stream or a river or to a lake or something or ocean. And so that's an interesting model that, you know, I don't know if the state would ever consider something like that here, um, but that's why and that's that's a big part of their business. So they don't rely, they're not relying on secondary treatment in soil or leach fields or anything. It goes direct to groundwater. That's how good the quality of the water coming out of the systems are. Um, so when you have those dense neighborhoods like that, that could be, you know, a potential uh, solution in the future. Um, the active systems in this case uh, apply very well to very small lots. Like we deal with some of these coastal lots or um, properties where there is no room to put a leach field. So you're stuck you, reusing the cesspool. And so putting this type of system in front of a cesspool that treats it, gets it to the quality, you can directly discharge it to groundwater with some UV disinfection as well. Um, so. Um, so the problem is the proximity to the water, the density, the um, uh, well, proximity to coastal water, proximity to groundwater, et cetera, all the things that we saw earlier. Um, really kind of the point of this slide is, again, Christina had some very similar um, graphics of how the water and the contamination and pollutants get to the groundwater. But really, the, the, just to point out that septic relies on the ground to do the treatment. In an aerobic system, it's active, it's done inside the tank. We're not actually relying on the ground to provide any treatment. It does get tertiary treatment before it will reach the groundwater. So it will clean up even further um, before that. Um, and we also just are, we have two series of tanks. One is what we call our C CE series. That's the NSF 40, and that's your basic aerobic system. It does have good nitrogen removal, but it doesn't meet the standard for NSF 245, which is the uh, standard for nitrogen removal. Three minutes, that's what the bell was for earlier. Okay, <laughs> I better hurry up. <laughs> um, but so we're not relying on the ground and, <clears throat> or, or, and we have very poor soils or we have no soils in some cases. So that's where an active treatment system can really be of value to, um, to the owners and such. So what is the solution to the problem? I probably just should have put the Fuji Clean logo, but that wouldn't be fair to everybody else then, right? So, I mean, aerobic itself, right? So if, and, and I've talked to 
um, Senior Pruder and the wastewater and even before her, you know, we'd really, ideally we'd like to see aerobic treatment and really get rid of septic. Septic is really, if you read the rules, is only a temporary solution. But of course, you know, with hardships of economics and, you know, people with cesspools never paid any sewer fees. So to even put in a septic tank in a leach field is a big expense to a homeowner. And yes, it's a little bit more to do aerobic, but we're cleaning the water much, much better than we can with a septic in the ground, which is unreliable. The leach fields only last for so long. So by providing oxidated water into the leach field, you're gonna really extend the life of a leach field or you're really only relying on the soil for your hydraulic loading and not to get rid of the pollutants. So that's kind of, you know, that's how we solve the problem. Um, number two, replace cesspools with aerobic treatment units. Um, you know, the, and VI obviously is working on the initiatives for uh, the proximity to shoreline and all the priority cases and the priority zones and everything. Um, so. Uh, you know, how can we tell we're making a difference? And that will be in time through future studies and all. Uh, a quick view of uh, Richard went over a little bit is we're generally a contact filtration system. It comes into a sedimentation chamber. We don't need a preloader in front of it. It's actually designed the first chamber is your preloader. And then it goes in overflows into your uh, anaerobic chamber, which then overflows into your aerobic chamber where you get your aerobic digestion. And then it recycles. It actually recirculates. So it's circuitous all the way back to the beginning. And that's really how you get your nitrogen reduction. You get the, so you're going from a nitrification stage back to a denitrification stage where your nitrogen is off-gassed um, through that anaerobic um, suboxic environment. Um, there's no submersible pumps or agitators. It's all done through air and air lift pumps. Um, so that's a great, uh, great feature with it as well. Uh, and this is just kind of an overview of the aerobic digestion process where it starts with ammoniification, nitrification, and denitrification. I'm not gonna go through the chemistry or anything. Really the highlight here is we do all the heavy lifting um, before the soil so that your leach field will um, be um, effective for years to come. And again, so we're, we're kind of more suited for, we're doing a lot of ET systems because we can clean the water, get the solids and fines down um, to go into evapotranspiration systems, anything where we have direct discharge of groundwater uh, through seepage pits and such. Um, these are easy to maintain, easy to operate, low cost on energy. Uh, so we have lots of different applications. I'll open it up to q and I'm sure my three minutes is over, right? <laughs> I didn't get the second ding, but yeah. I'm gonna, we're gonna turn on this microphone for you. There we go. And then we will circulate this. So does anyone have any questions? And I have a quick question. How many people in this room have a cesspool or know someone with a cesspool who has a cesspool? Um, yes, almost all of us do because there's so many and they're so spread out throughout Hawaii. So you can know how much per pervasive problems is. You mentioned that they're a little more expensive. Can you share order of magnitude? How much more expensive? And for those customers that are buying, are they consciously buying because they know it leapfrogs? Are they doing it because they're environmentally conscious? Or are they just not cost conscious? Not cost -sensitive? Yeah, and, and I mean, I can speak just in the past couple of years, uh, you know, the cost of just installing septic systems, which, you know, average probably on the big island, they probably average like 12 to 15,000 or a little bit cheaper over there for some reason. On Oahu, they were averaging maybe 18 to 20,000. But in the past two years, we're seeing averages of 25 to 28 just for septic systems, Ste septic with chambers and leach field basic. But it, a lot of it comes down to you're digging through rock, you're on a really small property. So you have all these plus plus factors. The incremental difference to go to aerobic is one going to depend on how large or how many bedrooms you have. So our smallest system can be landed in cost for about $9,000. So a uh, typical septic of that size is about 3000. So you've got, you know, say, $7,000 difference. On the larger system, you might get up to 12 or maybe 15,000 on the larger systems incrementally, your construction cost is almost exactly the same. You have a little bit of electric. I mean, it's really like all we have is a simple little 15 amp to run the blower. So, I mean, it's either put it in an existing circuit or add a sub panel. So the electric's really easy to install as well. Yeah. Hey Dennis, we have a question from Zoom. Mm -hmm. What is the typical leach field lifespan if a Fuji King tank is used? Yeah, well, I mean, First, it's going to be, be dependent on where you are in Oahu, right? So in some cases, we don't have 
a real good depth of soil or you're in rock and right into a preferential, you know, pathway to groundwater. Um, and, you know, if it's like somewhere on the big island, it's almost indefinite because it goes right into the rock and the groundwater. Um, so, you know, any the underlying soil, three feet of suitable soil will last you probably 50 years or more. I mean, you still have a small biomat. You still got some diff, uh, um, uh, reaction occurring because it's no, we're not at zero pollutants, right? We're, you know, we're at below 10. Um, so, you know, that, it's never been studied. So there's not an exact number. Typical leach field, you know, on the US, you look at studies are like 20 years. And then uh, depending on your soil quality could be seven years. Yeah. And just going back to your question or just this question earlier, um, part of this is some homeowners, if you're near the coast in a very, you know, area with shallow groundwater, um, you have to do something like this at ATU because you can't um, do have nitrogen levels and be that close to groundwater. So a lot of people are mandated. When we were in Stony Brook, Stony Brook's been testing these for 10 years. They use ATUs from different, you know, all different uh, companies across the world. And this is what first got our attention because we're presenting those that are best in their class. Um, Fuji Clean outperformed all of the other ones and they've been doing this for 10 years in these studies. So that really impressed us that looks like these guys are getting the best results. Yeah. Uh, welcome back here. Thank you. Um, for the Fuji Clean ATU, are vents and carbon filters needed for odor control? No. So the system is actually designed there. It has an extra vent port if need be, but because it's piped um, and plumbed directly with your house, it, um, it will back channel through your piping through your normal vent that's on the vaulted roof line. So no additional venting is needed. Okay, I have three questions. Three First questions? One, yeah. <laughs> Period yep. for, the, for the unit, O and M cost for the unit over the life of it. Mm -hmm. And can it be put into hardscape? In other words, can it be into a driveway or the lids? Can you get lids that sustain truck loads and that sort of thing? Yeah. So let's start with the first one. Richard, I forget the warranty was um, on the unit, the fiber, there's different parts like. I think the blower is your standard, like one year, you know, uh, warranty on the blower. I think the tank is, is it 10 years or something? No, I don't or, think so. That's, I think it's or two, okay. I, we have, I, I have the warranty sheet. I just actually haven't paid attention to it in a while. So, um, but there is some warranty on it, yeah. Um, the second question on, um, what was the second question? O&M. So a typical O&M, so the state requires twice a year. Um, most of our service providers on each of the islands charge somewhere around $125 to maybe $150 an hour. The service itself is pretty simple. So we're, we're checking this. We open up each of the chambers. Um, you're hosing down the, the um, scum on the front part of the sedimentation chamber. We have some brushes and some techniques to clean our lines and such in, uh, in between. Check the aeration system. Um, and so an average service is, runs about $250 to $300. Um, so most so you're you're seeing cost annual costs in the six to seven hundred dollars per year to maintain, which is pretty good for you know aerobic system twice a year. Uh, we're also you know we'd like to have at least quarterly. I mean ideally you know six months is a long time, especially you know we're finding um, the electricity goes out and they don't restart the air the aerator and then it goes septic on you. The sludge builds up and you know and such like that. So it does need eyes on it, unfortunately. And it's it's a growing issue here in Hawaii. Aerobic systems are, I mean, seen as thrown out numbers like ninety percent failure. <laughs> I don't believe that number quite, but it is. But it is exorbitantly high, unfortunately. And we're working on that. Fuji and I are are working on solutions to keep the homeowner so that the units are operating um, effectively. Um, which is important. Um, oops, I must have hit something there. Um, and then, yes, we do have H20 applications. Uh, we had a standard one, which was a pretty thick slab and some heavy rebar. Um, but uh, we actually have that being revised right now. So we're just go your stand, it'll be your standard six inch um, slab with like number four, number five rebar on center, you know, crisscross patterns. So, so we do have options for that. And we're doing, actually, I'm doing two of those this week. We've got three of our CEN systems being installed this week alone right now. One on the big island and two here. If anybody wants to come take a look at it, we can bring you there. Yeah, well, uh, just a quick question. From uh oh, I got the bell again. <laughs> uh, quick question. Uh, would this be possible in a no pass zone? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, well, yeah. So I do a lot within the no pass zone. 
and those are your ET systems. And so it, we, um, it cleans it. We have to put a pump um, vault after it because you have to get it pressurized into your subsurface irrigation. Um, but other than that, it's pretty straightforward. We've got plenty of those installed as well. All right, let's give that a round of applause if we could. Uh, we appreciate it. Thanks again. Thanks again for sponsoring us here today. Um, uh, and one of the things we also want you all to think about here and online is um, this, especially after COVID, is an opportunity to do workforce development in Hawaii. We are looking for companies that want to work here in Hawaii, employ local people, train local people. Because if you think about it, with 90,000, or like, you know, uh, Dennis said, you know, probably over 100,000 cesspools, this is one of the best green jobs programs that we have in the state. This could create, we've done, you know, estimates working with the top wastewater and government people in the state. This could create up to, you know, 2,000 jobs eventually. And these jobs pay well and they're long term, they're not dependent on tourism. So, all of these, I just want you to be thinking about that, you know, that. How can we develop and train people here in Hawaii to get more people who are not dependent on the kind of roller coaster ride of tourism and that are also doing jobs that help the economy? So now it's my pleasure to be uh, introduce you to Paul Sturm from Ridge to Reef, who's flown all the way from Maryland here and um, has done work, a lot of work in Hawaii. So let's give a round of applause for Paul. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to change it up a little bit. I'm going to talk more about nature-based treatment systems. Um, and really, the, the only thing that's different here is really the, with the incorporation of plants. Um, and so as a biologist and ecologist, um, working around the world on food security and water security issues, um, it, almost everywhere I've looked on islands in particular, you have a tremendous amount of failing uh, septic system, waste wastewater systems in general. And I think in part, that's because of the poor soils that are often on islands. And so uh, the historic use of septic systems and cesspools um, really has not been terribly effective um, in many of the locations that I've worked in. Um, so just, just introducing uh, some of our team that worked on this, Fal Mantha is an agronomist, um, Kelly Harris, who's here, she's an ecological engineer, and then myself, a biologist and kind of restoration ecologist. Um, and Ridge to Reefs is a nonprofit organization. We work with communities um, across the world, really. We work in Palau, American Samoa, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and then we also work kind of where my home is in the Chesapeake Bay as well. And, and what's nice about that is we're able to learn uh, effective models of treatment systems um, from really across the world. Um, and so it, when we start thinking about nature-based systems, um, we, we start thinking about, well, how does nature do these same functions? Um, and, and so we start thinking about bacterial denitrification, and so we start thinking about, we need to mimic the natural habitat of denitrifying bacteria, and as well as the flow conditions that allow those bacteria to treat uh, nitrate, um, as well as convert uh, ammonia into, into nitrate for additional treatment. Um, we also think about filtration and incorporation. So we use things like sand, biochar, um, and other media and then with evapotranspiration, um, we're really looking to reduce the volume of water that's passing through these systems um, because um, we all can do well on concentration, but if we can reduce that volume, and in some cases we can get to zero discharge, really that's gonna be the best outcome for our reefs. Um, so again, evapotranspiration as well as biofilms are, are things that we focus on. Um, and, and so really this started just from seeing this so frequently um, in some of the sites. So this is um, in American Samoa. Uh, this was a classroom, a pre-K classroom that they were building on. 
And um, this is a bay that had significant impacts from septic systems. All the, you know, every, and the soils there are very sandy and they have coral sand, like coral stone and sand. So imagine uh, discharging into a system like this. The majority of effluent is all going right into the groundwater and right out to the reefs. And you could see uh, when you go along the shoreline, there's a tremendous amount of algal growth and there's algal growth on the reefs themselves because of that, that factor. So obviously regular septic systems don't work in a situation like this. Um, so in this case, what we did, um, you know, we just, this was the, the, sept the septic system right there uh, that they were installing. And this was like a pilot project. So we excavated it. We lined it with an impermeable liner, um, and then we, you know, we plumbed it um, and had a small um, uh, leach field. Uh, but essentially, we planted vetiver grass and used a lot of carbonaceous material uh, to create that habitat for uh, the, the the biota that we wanted. Um, and when we've tried to monitor this system, I'll show a picture of what it looks like now. It's very difficult to even monitor the system because the vetiver, the grass that we're using is taking up the majority of that effluent. Um, that grass also has one of the highest abilities of nature to incorporate nitrogen uh, into it. And so this is what that system looks like now. Um, and essentially, um, we've had a really difficult even measuring anything coming out of it um, because of how effective um, that vetiver grass is. Uh, this is another project. This is in Puerto Rico. Um, and this, you know, this was something that we discovered when we were studying this watershed, um, that this, the septic system at this hotel, Guanica 1929, 27 room hotel, uh, was actually surcharging, um, overflowing into the coastal waters um, because the leach field was no longer working. Um, they had built like a parking lot over it. Um, they probably didn't even know it was there necessarily. And it probably had been surcharging for, you know, this, this went back to the plantation era early, you know, the early 1900s, probably 1929, and uh, probably had been failing for all that time. Um, so we designed a system that could treat 600 gallons per day. Uh, we estimated how much evapotranspiration we could get from the vetiver grass. And we also used wood chips. Um, so we kind of co combined a denitrifying bioreactor with uh, the vegetative um, vetiver grass. Um, and so that's, that's the result of that system. Um, again, this is, this is a system that we can't measure discharge out of during normal conditions. Um, there is discharge into the, into the leach field um, during, um, you know, like Christmas vacation when there's a tremendous amount of people, all the rooms are filled, they have a restaurant as well. Um, and, and that we actually saw discharge into the drain field. Um, but we also saw in over 50% uh, nitrogen removal of that limited amount of discharge that we were still getting through that system. Um, so kind of moving on to Hawaii, um, I think that you know, several years ago, um, you know, having worked on some sediment issues in West Maui and other places, um, really got to understand the problem of cesspools here in Hawaii. So we, you know, we wanted to create a nature-based system and then also work with University of Hawaii to have it tested uh, to see if it met the NSF criteria. Um, and this was interesting because of the design, we had to, we didn't want to use as much vegetation because we didn't want to fail this, we didn't want to fail because we didn't have discharge. So we knew we had to not use as big a surface area because we did not want to uh, evapotranspirate all our, our, our effluent. Um, and so anyway, that's, that's the system um, as we installed it and it's being monitored by University of Hawaii we're in the sixth month of that. Um, it's averaging over 70% removal of nitrogen. Um, and that's not even counting the volume reduction that we're getting from the vetiver grass. So we know that that's, that's contributing to that load reduction that we're looking, looking at. That's another picture 
Um, and I'll go through the process a little bit. Um, we use an aerobic sand layer. Um, and re really we're working on converting that ammonia to uh, NO2 and then NO3 that can be, um, that can be uh, treated by those denitrifying bacteria in the, um, in the wood chip in the uh, anaerobic section. Um, so we also use biochar. Again, biochar is good at absorbing ammonia. Um, and we also use an, or have an anaerobic wood chip layer. And part of the idea here is that we're trying to use things from the waste stream. So we're using anaerobic or we're using uh, wood chips um, that are from invasive species um, that are so prolific across Hawaii. So the idea is, hey, let's get rid of invasive species and use those as our carbonaceous source, as well as biochar that's created from local materials as well. And then we're working on a project that we would uh, use, we would uh, take used glass and create aerobic sand for the aerobic layer um, because we, we're really focused on minimizing the, the, uh, the, car, the climate, the, the footprint, uh, the, carbon, the carbon footprint um, of these types of projects. Um, in addition, we've done some calculations in terms of how much carbon sequestration uh, we can get from these type of systems. So there's a certain amount of carbon sequestration offset that happens. Um, each vetiver plant is able to, to, to significantly um, you know, pull carbon out of the atmosphere. And just kind of going through um, the process, you have filtration and absorption, and then the denitrification just puts off you know, um, N2 gas, which is 80% of the atmosphere anyway. And then the evaporation, of course, or evapotranspiration. And so one of the reasons um, we used vetiver grass is that this, the, the bottom part of that graph is zero to 360 days. And vetiver grass continues to put on weight and biomass, both subsurface and above surface uh, on an annual basis. It has no annual cessation period like almost any other type of grass. It's gonna grow, then it's gonna die back a little bit, then it might grow again. But vetiver grass continues to put on biomass, both um, above surface and below surface. Um, uh, Kelly also did some calculations um, looking at how much evapotranspiration we can expect to get. Um, and this is from a, a, you know, an existing study that showed um, and looked at plant height versus the amount of evapotranspiration that you get with vetiver grass. And so the idea here is um, as that vetiver grass ages and gets older, it's able to uptake a lot more water um, as, it height, as its height grow. And, and, and they can grow to four to, um, four to five feet tall, um, sometimes even taller. Um, and so the idea is that the uh, vegetation factor or the evapotranspiration factor is around 2.5. Like let's say one might be for a normal uh, grass. Um, and so the idea here is that when we use vetiver grass, we're able to reduce some of that surface area uh, by 3.7 uh, times, essentially. Um, so again, we think that you can potentially shrink the size of your treatment area and potentially use this um, in your, um, your leach field as well. Um, and, and again, Again, I think we're trying to approach uh, like a zero discharge system when, when we think about, and also minimize the surface area of these because we know that's, that land and space is a premium here in Hawaii. Um, so again, uh, testing with UH to meet the DOH criteria should be complete at the end of August. Um, nitrogen removal is over 70%. Thus far, the standard is 50%. Uh, the project is meeting other water, the other water quality parameters. Um, and you can see we used, uh, you know, different data plants um, as well as the vetiver grass um, within this treatment system. 
And in general, um, it's a much lower cost than, than a lot of the ATUs and other systems. Um, you know, the, the tricky part is really understanding uh, the construction costs associated um, and excavation costs um, to, to essentially put a, a dollar sign on these. And I think we have a couple pilot projects that are scheduled both probably in Maui and in Oahu. And I think we'll be able to put a better number on this system. And we had to build this above ground because we were measuring it. We'll be able to build it in ground and essentially using a liner um, in order to keep, to separate the surface water, I mean, to separate the groundwater from the surface water, essentially. Um, another project that we're working on, I just wanted to mention briefly is in Maui, uh, we're working with a number of um, local organizations, including Sunshine Vetiver Solutions. Uh, John Astilla is the, the, the uh, project director there. And um, we've been working on these ideas for some time in terms of how to incorporate these types of practices to get rid of in injection water or water that's currently being injected into the groundwater, and then that's impacting the, the nearshore coral reefs. Um, so one of the ideas is uh, creating better for fields, essentially, um, in, and spacing them such that we can use surface irrigation and uh, sprinkler irrigation, or, or drip irrigation and surface irrigation, um, and essentially dispose of you know, thousands or millions of gallons of wastewater um, so that it's not impacting the coral reefs like it is now. Because um, there's, there's, I think there's over 5 million gallons a day in Maui alone that's being injected into the groundwater that's then impacting the reefs. Um, this is a modified SAT basin. Um, that's another one we're testing. Um, that testing is ongoing now, probably for the next six to 12 months. Um, and the idea here is uh, essentially creating a basin using things like biochar and sand and vetiver grass to treat, to treat that effluent um, so that it's not contaminating the groundwater before it's discharged. And the last one is just a denitrifying bioreactor. Um, and one of our goals there um, is to preserve the volume of water. Uh, it, especially if it's going to be reused for something like agriculture. Um, and, and, and so anyway, that's, that's the third sort of case that we're um, testing. Um, and these are just some relevant literature where uh, the removal of pharmaceutical re residues by wood chip uh, bioreactors, the reduction of nitrogen loads, uh, bacteria and virus removal and denitrifying bioreactors and these types of practices. So all, all this stuff is well documented. Um, and, you know, 1 billion people worldwide do not have access to clean drinking water and 2 billion do not have access to proper sanitation. Um, so I think part of our idea is how do we um, have it so we can use things from the waste stream to treat this waste source uh, so that we can have better, better outcomes for coastal water quality and uh, groundwater quality as well. So yeah, there's just questions. All right, I'm gonna turn on this microphone for you. And then uh, we have some questions. Yes, in the back. Yeah. Another talk. Excellent presentation. Uh, just a question, where you mean your collection of data for also collecting any ammonia along with your nitrates and impact of heavy metals. Um, how is that being that data being collected? Yeah, yes. The the removal rates for um we I don't know that we're looking at heavy metals necessarily, um, but we are looking at uh nitrate, ammonia, a full suite of um water quality parameters that meet both the NSF 240 and the NSF or the NSF 245 and the NSF 40. Yeah. And uh, just for a little uh, background, when we were looking at Stony Brook again, because this is an example, they're 10 years ahead of us. Um, Fuji Clean was best in its class for ATUs, but 
So I've made developed something called an NRV, nitrogen reducing fire reactor, because they have such a problem with nitrogen there. And this model is kind of based on that. And that's uh, you know another one of the holy grails. Can you do something that doesn't require electricity? Um, and they're only, you know, we like to say there's no one silver bullet for this issue. We have many arrows in our quiver because there are going to be some areas where this might work, but you need more land space, more area. And if you have a tight space, you know, an AT unit, unit is going to probably work better. So we need everything we can get. Um, but you had a question online. Thank you. From Zoom, how often do the wood chips need to be replaced? And how would you go about doing that if it's located on the bottom of the system? It's the first two questions. Sure. No, that, that's a great question. So the the half-life of wood chips is uh, 30 years approximately. And I think that sometimes more into yeah. So the the half-life of wood chips is approximately 30 years. And I think there's there's probably some discrepancy whether if you're using a pine or a hardwood, a softwood or a hardwood. Um, but again, the half-life being 30 years, and you still, even after 30 years, you would still have plenty of carbonaceous material for those denitrifying bacteria to live on in order to continue to perform that function. Um, so, so I, I mean, I, I mean, we would put it at least 30 years, and I think that. But there's denitrifying bioreactors in the Northeast that you know are continuing to operate. Um, and um, so anyway, in, in some of the tropical hardwoods here, including some of the invasives, are super hard wood. So we would expect them to even last longer. Thank you. And then um, what is the typical footprint requirement for uh, an amount of wastewater? Yeah, so the, the, the project that we built um, at the Honolulu, the East Honolulu Wastewater Treatment Plant to, to have tested, um, that's approximately six by 14 um, by about three and a half feet tall. Um, so, so the idea, and that's for a three bedroom home. So you can kind of scale it from there in terms of like a four bedroom or a five bed bedroom or a two bedroom. So. All right, we have time for one more question. Yeah, I think we have a question for you all. Uh, they might, uh, they're in town, uh, like I said, from the East Coast, and they're going out to this pilot project, East, um, the East Honolulu Wastewater Treatment Plant, which has the benefit of uh, having the best site near a beach. Um, it's gorgeous. If anybody wants to um, check that out, uh, let Paul or Kelly know, um, and they can take you out to see it. Because again, if we can do this, if we can find a way to do a passive nitrogen reducing bioreactor that works, that's going to be substantially cheaper, this is going to be something that will really be kind of a, a game changer in Hawaii. So let's give uh, Paul a big round of applause. If you're there. And uh, moving into the decentralized area of more community scale solutions. So let's have a big round of applause for Bill Musiak, who's here from Boston. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. Yep, we uh, took us a year and a half to finally meet uh, in person. So very happy to be here. Took me 50 years to make it to Hawaii. Um, so Lewis took me shopping because the stuff I brought to wear was not uh, up to speed for uh, Aloha wear. So thank you, Lewis. I appreciate that. Um, and I will wear this on my calls with you guys every week or the other one. I bought two of them. So. Um, so I'm going to be pretty brief today because I'll, I'll open it up for questions. Um, we're happy to be here. And Cambrian is a... This one? Yeah. Now I'm good? Yeah. Thanks. Um, Cambrian is a company based in Watertown, Massachusetts, which is a suburb of Boston. Um, it was founded about 13 years ago. The founder is still the CEO, and we've grown the company to a little over 30 people now. Um, very exciting time. When I first got to the company, um, we were looking at the Elemental Accelerator uh, uh, deal day and also to, to join the ninth cohort, and we were lucky enough to do that. And so that's how I got interested in Hawaii, and 
um, would have come here sooner if it wasn't for COVID. And that's how we were able to open a Honolulu office and hire Lewis, get to work with Pacific Current, get to work with Vi. So very, uh, very good time for our company in our growth mode. So I think this aligns with what everybody in the room is trying to do, trying to uh, make distributed water reuse simple, sustainable, and cost-effective. Um, you know, we're all about taking wastewater and finding all the um, all the benefits of it. So reusing the water for irrigation or for cooling towers or for boilers. Um, and we're looking to make renewable energy from, from methane when we have the ability to use an anaerobic uh, digester. And I'll talk about our case study here in Hawaii in a minute. So we're actually kind of past the, the startup stage. We've, we've built a number of systems. We have about 22 systems operating right now. Um, mostly in the United States, mostly on high strength industrial waste from breweries, wineries, um, beverage companies. Uh, the latest project is gonna be at a dairy. So very high, some, some of these plants have 35,000 pounds of COD per day and make enough biogas to make a megawatt of energy um, every, every day. So um, big stuff. Uh, so we've treated 2 billion gallons of, of wastewater so far, and we've created three giga, gigawatt hours of renewable energy. If you take a look here, we have some core technologies that we use in our systems. Um, the EcoVolt reactor is an um, anaerobic digester. We couple that with um, some proprietary technology that we call the booster skid. It has electrodes in it. We create um, bacteria in there that do electromethanogenesis. So they're growing on the electrode and they're another pathway to make biogas. Um, it's very efficient. It also gives us feedback on how healthy the bioreactor is. So that's kind of one of the first patents that we came up with and differentiates us. Um, so that's anaerobic. On the aerobic side, we have a membrane bioreactor um, that's for low strength waste. We use that on municipal strength waste. We use that to polish the effluent from the anaerobic system. Um, that is something we do in, in packaged, you can see it's a packaged plant. So uh, aeration basin is actually in an above ground tank. And then the membrane system sits in that, what looks like a shipping container with all the pumps and blowers built in. So it's very modular, very efficient use of space, and we can expand it very easily. The BioViper is a technology that we acquired from a company called Basswood. We acquired them about two years ago, and they were um, doing kind of in the middle. So it's a bulk treatment aerobic system and think of it as a trickling filter inside of a tank. So there's media inside that tank that's doing attached growth aerobic treatment. Half of the media is submerged. So we have a couple of different zones doing different things with the bugs. Um, and so we can take higher strength waste and treat it to source strength and help our customers avoid surcharges being paid to the municipality. Um, so that's a, a great addition to our system. They also had a couple of pretty interesting customers that they brought along with them, uh, and Curry, including uh, Curry, Dr. Pepper. So we have a, a number of installations at their, uh, their soft drink plants around the US. Then FlowLogic is our proprietary um, kind of artificial intelligence for doing monitoring, control, system optimization. Um, and it's, it's great because you can look at all the plants on your phone, on your iPad, on your computer, from anywhere. Um, our operators are uh, have permission to change set points remotely so they don't have to drive to the plant every time. Uh, so very efficient operations. And I won't read all the bullets, but what we're trying to do is, um, is lower OPEX. So we've done a very good job of making our systems very affordable from the capital side, and now we're trying to lower the OPEX for our customers and for ourselves. So when I say for ourselves, one of the unique things that Cambrian does is we offer what we call a WEPA, which is a water energy purchase agreement, or if you're familiar with uh, solar power, like a power purchase agreement. So we will design, fabricate, install, own, operate, um, maintain the system for our customers and charge a per gallon fee. So the customer has no upfront capital expense. Um, they don't have to pay us a fee until the system's in the ground and we're actually treating the wastewater. So um, 
It's a very, very uh, interesting proposition. We have a number of those um, operating and, and under agreement and construction. Uh, get to the one in Hawaii very shortly here. But just as a um, as a summary, you know, we're using our proprietary technology that has very low opex. We have the um, the flow logic to do all of our data acquisition and to optimize operations, simple systems, and we're selling water on a per gallon, dollar per gallon basis. And what we're trying to do is bring clean water and clean energy back around in a loop and, and close the, um, you know, try to get to, you know, not zero liquid discharge, but very close to it. Try to reuse all the water and only truck off the solids. As Stuart kindly mentioned at the beginning, um, we were selected as uh, one of the members of the ninth cohort of Elemental Accelerator, um, which allowed us to help fast track a project here in Hawaii. Um, we established the Honolulu office by hiring Lewis last year, and our first week of projects in Hawaii was executed in December. And we're hoping to have that operating by Q2 of 22. Um, we're partnering obviously with Pacific Current, with Elemental, with Vi. And um, our customer is uh, Pacific Biodiesel, and, and Bob King is here. So thank you, Bob, for uh, for becoming one of our partners. We're really excited to uh, to get this project moving. Um, so at Bob's plant on the Big Island, um, they're making uh, biodiesel, and the waste stream coming off of that process, plus some of the waste coming in from the raw material, is very high strength. Um, Bob is not really keen on sending it down to Hilo or trucking it off or putting it back in shipping containers and moving it around by boat to other islands. So we're gonna treat it all on site. Um, we're gonna use anaerobic digester, make biogas, make electricity. And then we're gonna use an MBR downstream to polish the effluent and um, recycle that water so he can use it in his cooling towers. So close the loop on both, both streams. Um, we're excited to uh, have that in engineering right now. And as it comes to financial close with our financial partner, we will um, we will start uh, moving material over here and uh, and pouring concrete. So we're going to be in compliance with all the local regulations. We're going to be uh, responsible. One of the other things I said in a week, but one of the things that we take on is the permitting requirements also. So we'll take on all that responsibility. We'll be responsible for monitoring and. Um, enabling water reuse and reducing all the trucking and shipping waste. So a lot of impact for, for Bob and for Hawaii. And there's Bob. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> and just a little kind of wrap up on, on Cambrian. Um, we have 27 patents and 21 more pending, uh, three trademarks. And we started off really, our, um, our CEO was, uh, student at MIT where he did his PhD and another gentleman that did his PhD together, um, both looking into aerospace and ways to solve water problems in space that spurred a bunch of grants. And the company was actually kickstarted by, um, by, the, by NASA, by NIH, by uh, the military. So um, we were lucky enough to have that happen and also commercialized the product as we went. And now we're growing and um, this year is a very strong year for us. We're uh, booking a number of projects and um, can't mention a couple of the customers' names yet, but um, the biggest project we have that just started up is um, at Anchor Brewing in San Francisco. It's in downtown San Francisco. We were actually able to get uh, the, the city of San Francisco to um, allow us to build this plant, do discharge, reuse, um, it's a, it's a huge win for us and a huge win for Anchor. Anchor is actually owned by a Japanese company called Sapporo. Um, so we're doing more projects with them as well. Um, and we're looking to do probably three more WEPAs this year. And um, the goal is to do six more next year. So hopefully my boss isn't online because I'm not making that promise yet. Um, but that's that's the end of my presentation. That's a that's one of our BioViper systems at one of the, the correct Dr. Pepper plants. Um, interesting uh, interesting customer to have and now they're uh, they're expanding a number of their plants actually because of the the seltzer craze and so soft drink companies are now 
um, expanding and making lots of uh, hard seltzers and um, other drinks and their wastewater is getting out of control. So it's good business to be in. So thank you. All right. Happy to take some questions. Yeah, thank you. I'll turn this on for you. I think that's already on. Yeah. All right, who's got some questions? Now, this is exciting because we've got, you know, one of the businesses in the room, financial operators. This is what we call synergy. People coming together for new innovative technology. And it's just so cool because these are not only, you know, great companies like Bob's um, and Kelly's and Civic Biodiesel that's so innovative, but they're just people that are mission driven that want to do what's right for Hawaii. And, and you know, it's just been an incredible success story. Do you have a question? Yeah. So I want to first give full disclosure um, that my, my bigger interest in um, when, when I first found about this technology was in the community. And we have this area of condos that uh, I think it's 23 foot projection wells in Mahalaya that, that discharge into the bay. The bay is officially um, declared an impaired water by the EPA. So that was my first concern. I really wanted them to go there with the first type of project at the time they didn't work out for the grant. But so, so then I love you. We'll talk about. <laughs> but um, you know, my my question is that in, in that project and probably other projects, I mean, if we could do these projects where we're addressing hundreds of versus one unit at a time, we get through that eighty-eight thousand number much faster. But what's missing, I think, is I don't think it's going to be to just not alive, but is that conveyance section, which is estimated to be about $4 million to get the conveyance of the sewage to the unit. And we have like um, you know, plans to try to develop that financial um, source. And, and you can go ahead and ask my friend Chris Lee about safe funding if you want. <laughs> but you know, that, that's all the problems. Yeah. <laughs> but that's going to be important because of the fact that. The county looks at the SRF fund because it's a loan as, a, um, as something that needs payment. And so when they look at a, a project like this that has private, um, it's a private entity that the ratepayers are paying directly, that money doesn't go to the county to pay back the bond. And so there's, a, there's that issue with the SRF fund. Uh, and open to any ideas for getting over that because I think this is important. It has so many implications for for um, housing development. So that's a lot of people. That's a really good point about like new housing developments. It's gonna be much easier to do this when you can build it in when they're developing them. And we need to make sure and mandate that they do do these. You know, in the past they were just using injection wells and now Supreme Court case about injection wells on Maui. This is, you know, everything is kind of up in the air right now. So it's a very interesting and challenging and exciting time, but, um, you know, do you want to talk um, about Phil, the the pro you know the project potential project in Malaya? Because it's very exciting. Um, it's challenging because of all the permits and things. But maybe just talk a little bit about that. Um, the Malaya condos. Sure. So there are ten condo units, and then there's an aquarium. There's a commercial triangle with a lot of uh, like restaurants. There's a harbor there, and it doesn't make sense to build ten or fifteen separate plants it, it's just it's untenable it's too expensive so to have one centralized plant we did a design for it and the problem is the way that the condos are set up they all have different condo associations and there's no one that speaks for the 10 condos all at once so there would have to be some kind of master agreement so first we'd have to understand who's actually going to give us the the purchase order um you know and stand by it and then, as Kelly mentioned, like it's an expensive and probably complicated collection system, um, just because of the elevation of the land and where things are. Some would have to be pumped, some could be gravity, and um, we actually went as far as looking for an offtaker for the reuse water because we don't want to put it down the injection well. We want to put it. It's going to be very clean. It can be. I think we went to R2, but we could go to R1 pretty simply and do land application. There's a lot of land right near there. So we actually talked to people to take the, the water. Um, so it'd have to be a distribution system set up with the effluent to go to that land and then maybe a surface spray system, maybe a drip irrigation. So it's just, there's a lot of moving parts. And I guess the piece that we're a little hesitant to bite off on is we don't want to own a collection system and maintain it. Um, that's not in our 
our purview. Now we will do that, but we were looking to hopefully find a way for for Maui to to be the collection and you know so we're not we're not there yet but the customer's interested and they there are systems there that are very old and they're putting horrible water down into the um into the outfall and it's the way that the injection wells were designed they were thinking that the water might percolate offshore 300 400 feet and it's five feet offshore and it's it's in the reef so something has to be done so we're looking for creative solutions and there's been almost, you know, we're working with someone who grew up there in a home in Manalaya. He lives in one of the condos. He said there's been a 70% reduction in reef coverage. He said it is, it was pristine when he was younger. It is destroyed now. So we're talking about the health of our reefs. Um, the good news is there's a $1.3 trillion infrastructure bill that includes water and wastewater coming down the pipe. So again, now is the time. Hawaii needs to be bold. Um, and we have, uh, I want to thank uh, Sina Pruder and Joanna Sito from the Department of Health. Um, they're on virtually that we, you know, Joanna has done a great job with the drinking water branch and getting those state revolving funds and SRF money. Um, and we should be hiring people that really focus on that because there's millions of dollars of federal money that we can get. We just need to, you know, uh, make sure that we're doing it. Um, we, do we have time for one more question or are we running? I mean, maybe one more because it was only one question. But yeah. yeah. And one more question, anybody? Uh, yes. Yeah. Can you um, tell us uh, more about the sizing of the system? Uh, what's the minimum size that you, I mean, around? Uh, so, yeah. so we're, we're, we're looking at a smallest system around 5,000 gallons per day is, is what makes economic sense for us. And it, we said it's scalable, yeah. It is, it's, it's, it's scalable. So we can build blocks. We have different sized blocks. So we have a 5,000 gallon block, similar to what you saw in the, um, in the, the brochure that was just handed out. So we have building blocks. So we build certain size tanks and then we can double the capacity as we go, depending on build out. So where do you select the influence for the um, the ground? So typically, what we do is design everything on slab above ground, so everything would flow into a Q tank. So typically, you collect in a pit or some, somewhere on site from the customer location, and then we pump to our EQ pH control, and then so there's there's a number of pumping steps but we have designed systems with underground eq so it could all be gravity exactly you're welcome Thanks so much and um everybody please you know stay around for networking that's going to be the most important part when we break up any group um i know you probably have more comments and questions so they'll be around here uh, for dinner and then during the table discussions. But let's give a round of applause for Bill. And, um, very exciting stuff. So, you know, as Kelly mentioned, this is uh, really important now that we are talking about decentralized community scale systems where we can try to get hundreds and, you know, even thousands of people and homes um on these systems especially when you have condos you know that are all situated together um and so our our next uh partner is at that level as well um is biomass controls um and we met them uh at uh when senator chris lee and i uh when were invited to the bill and melinda gates foundation to give a talk and immediately the director of the foundation said i want you to meet this guy jeff hollowell um, unfortunately, they were planning to be here. They couldn't be here, um, and but they're just an amazing company. And we've been working with CEO Derek D'Souza and Jeff Hollowell, and we also have weekly calls with them. Um, and their mission is to offer these technologies and innovations to enable rapid refinement of sanitation. And they use agricultural and food um, outputs to treat pathogens, reduce greenhouse gases, sequester carbon, and improve soil health. And 
they do this, um, you know, they have, it's even though they're a private company, they definitely are mission driven to help human health, the climate and the environment. And they wanna be a leader. They've got pilot projects around the world um, in India in past Pakistan. And ironically, the one in India, one of their units is a town called Bai, W-A-I. So we knew we were in the right place when we were partnered with this company. Um, it's just one of the signs. Um, and so they are um, a, a leader in this field and one of the more successful of the Gates technologies around the world. These are some milestones. That's Jeff on the right. And that was the exhibit where I met him in Beijing. Um, and as you can see, they've gotten all kinds of, uh, been invited to all kinds of accelerator cohorts um, and developed projects um, around the world. You know, they were focused originally because of the Gates Foundation um, on human waste. They've moved into animal waste. Now they're doing food waste. And the great thing about this technology, which is based on pyrolysis, is they can take all kinds of inputs um, to, to process them. This is the um, like interior view of the equipment. They have a number of uh, patents and, and ones that are pending. Um, and they have uh, this uh, Kelvin app where also everything can be monitored on their phones. Um, so it's amazing that if anything is just goes off scale a little bit or they can get pinged on their phones. Um, and so it's a, you know, it's based on an ancient technology um, or practice, I should say, in the Amazon, um, what they called terra preta, black earth, um, where they burned uh, waste and put it into the soil. And they found even 800, 1,000 years later, the soil still held up. They were rich with carbon. They didn't erode. Um, they had lots of microbiotic life. And so they've taken this and, and really developed it into a very exciting um, technology. So part of the, um, you know, the environmental effects is there's a reduction of odor, pathogens, greenhouse gas emissions, um, nutrient leaching, because a lot of this sludge waste would normally be taken to a landfill. Um, and uh, they avoid that because at the landfills, there's often nutrient leaching. Um, and our landfills are already filled, as uh, Kelly knows well, and um, in Maui, they're um, reaching capacity and as most are on our island. But there's also, in working with Jim Mothersbaugh, we found that they're really just basic um, savings, economic savings as well, and we can recover uh, the nutrients we can use them as fertilizers, soil amendments, and um, we do volume reduction, and we can get refuse, re reuse efficiency um, in that you capture a lot of these gases and you can use that for energy and you can use the products for many different things from water filtration to air filtration um, and to a soil amendment. Um, and you know, we always remember, especially these companies that are international, that sanitation is one of the largest, you know, causes of disease and death around the world. Um, and so it's important to kind of remember that, that what we're doing here is, has global implications because there are all kinds of um, deadly, uh, you know, contaminants that, uh, you know, we're lucky here in that we don't deal with them as much, but we're still dealing with them. Hawaii has the highest, you um, MRSA and staff rates in, in the country. Um, so uh, two times the level of, um, Christina, correct me, two times the level of staff and four times the level of MRSA? Yes. <laughs> um, so this is kind of uh, the output um, where you take those biological solids, you know, the, the sludge that no one has been able to reuse yet and you reduce it to this odorless pathogen-free um, biochar that looks and feels like coffee grounds. Um, and you have a 90% reduction of solids volume, 50% reduction in greenhouse gases. Um, there's nitrogen fixing in the biochar um, that can improve soil health. And this is the most important thing as far as the EPA. We're talking about 90% removal of persistent um, chemicals and pathogens and chemicals of emerging, uh, contaminants of emerging concern, COC. Um, they have amazing results with PFAS and uh, PFAS. And this is something that the EPA is very, very concerned about. 
um, these endocrine disruptors that are getting into everything in our water now. And so if we can eliminate it here, then, um, you know, and capture the greenhouse carbon, this is actually a, a carbon sink. So we can't re reach our green, you know, our goals um, for, for greenhouse gas reduction, unless we have things that are not only reducing carbon, but actually are sinks that are negative carbon to help us get to neutral. And just to remember that, you know, 80% of wastewater goes back into the East ecosystem without being treated um, or reused throughout the world. Um, and these are some of the plants that they've got um, are around the country and around the world. Um, there's another one, like I mentioned, in Bai, India. Um, and like uh, Cambrian, they are scalable um, and mobile, which is really important. And um, they uh, were really excited to be working with them. Um, we applied for an LML Accelerator grant this year. Um, and we're working with Water Tectonics, Jim Mothersbaugh, who um, is based out of Washington, but he also um, owns and operates a small wastewater treatment plant in McKenna, Maui. And we're very excited about this. They're moving forward on, a, on their first pilot project. Um, and uh, Jim is one of the most innovative people I know. And so when we introduced them to biomass, he did his research and his due diligence for you know, six months at least. And he's like, this is something. Um, there's a lot of potential here. So we're really excited about that. Um, basically, you know, these are kind of, it fits with the circular economy principles that we embrace. We're trying to get stuff away from the landfill. Um, and, you know, Jim was talking about like at landfills, he was doing 90 truckloads to the local landfill. And you can imagine the greenhouse gases that are associated with that, the tipping fees, all the expenses. If you can reduce that completely and process all that on site, um, you're avoiding taking stuff the way you know, to the landfill um, where you continue to produce greenhouse gases. But here, um, you know, you're, you're, you're have all these different inputs on one side, um, but then you have all these different uses on, on the other side. Um, the carbon capture, the uh, energy that's produced, thermal energy, pasteurized water. Um, and so together, if you can imagine, Cambrian and biomass controls if we can compare that, you could do 100% recycling of solids and liquids. That would be a first. That would be a major accomplishment that would have global implications. And I think this is where we're moving. Um, this is where we need to go. When right now we spend hundreds of millions of dollars with these expensive municipal plants just to separate the clean drinking water that we flush with from all these nutrients and solids, and then we pump it out to sea. Um, and we don't need those nutrients in the water, we need them on land. Um, and so this is kind of the bold vision that Y and our partners are embracing, you know, that if we can move to this, we can literally, Paul Hawkins says in his new book, Drawdown, biochar is one of the top, top exciting developments that could change everything. And like we said, these are a number of the partners around the country and these are the different inputs. Um, human uh, waste, animal waste, you know, with all our piggeries and 30% of our waste stream is food. Um, that's ridiculous that it's ever sent to, you know, uh, to, to be burned or, you know, at H power or to a landfill where it continues to produce methane. Um, and, uh, you know, restaurants were required to send at their certain size, this waste to piggeries, but then piggeries have their own problems and so you could use this to help to treat the waste from the piggeries, but also even avoid a lot of that waste going there. Um, so we're excited about the different applications of this. This is the team. Jeff Hollowell is the founder. Derek is the CEO. Jeff Wong and then Allison um, all work together in this. Everywhere they set up these plants, they, um, they are, are very big about um, diversity and equity and inclusion. So they hire local people, they make sure it's a diverse team, and they're very excited about, excited about coming to Hawaii and doing just that. And even though um, they've got 250 years, they, they're much younger than that when you see them in person. <laughs> um, and this is what I was saying about diversity and equity, um, all their plants around the world. 
um, are, are really uh, diverse teams and they've kind of energized the local economy. Um, and this from UNESCO, we really need to, you know, make sure that this is an affordable source of water, energy and nutrients and other recoverable materials because we're wasting it right now. Um, and so this is just a little bit about them, but I'd like to kind of open it up for questions and discussions, if we could. Who would like to ask a question? Hold on one second here. Thanks, I have, I have two questions. Uh, one is the, the size and for either BTUs or, or tons a, a day that the uh, starter size on a unit like this. The second is, does it make, does it produce any pyrolysis oil? Good question. Um, Jim Mothersbaugh in the back, who's bought the, you know, in the process of purchasing that first unit, I think can answer that question um, well. Thank you, Jim. Good question. Um, if we're going to do a production, will you use part of um, The system that we're looking at at McKenna uh, will do roughly 1,200 dry pounds a day. Um, and so, uh, put that in perspective, a 100,000 gallon um, per day wastewater plant produces roughly 2,000 pounds of biosolid. Uh, dry um, the thing that is really exciting, which is separate from this group in Hawaii, but it actually is combined, is that the Department of Energy has come in behind it with a major grant uh, in the millions. Um, and we have put together a team on pyrolysis people around the country, including a Dr. Crow from the University of Hawaii, who is the top uh, chart person here. And so there's a lot of black art and misinformation about plant chart. People will say, well, it's the worst thing I've ever done, it's the best thing I've ever done, and nobody really knows why it was so good or so bad. They just know it was something happened. So with this group, which is made up of the University of Cincinnati, UC Berkeley, UCLA, it just keeps going on, EPA, Region 9, um, Colorado State, um, we are going to actually be determining what is the porosity point that you want to make the biochar at, how much air is needed in the reaction chamber to make the best absorption, but then even more so, how do you desorb? So that if you are going to absorb phosphate, how do you actually put it in the soil and know when it's going to release that phosphate? And so all of these questions are, we're in a major program right now, and it's, it's really exciting uh, because we, we are looking at actually taking a, an old fashioned material and also almost making it what they call a precision separation system. And, uh, and that's less than a year away. Biomass uh, actually donated a complete system to Colorado State so that the work we do in McKenna can be duplicated in Colorado State uh, with the national labs to determine exactly what is happening. And so it's, um, it, it's sort of a fun project. Yeah. Hope that helps. Yeah, but thank you. We are looking at oil separation, but in the future, not at this one. And the exciting thing is that we can use it uh, like in biofilters for stormwater um, reduction, capturing nutrients um, before they get out into the near shore. Um, so there are a lot of exciting applications. Other questions? One at a time, please. Yeah, Paul. So when, um, so would it, would it be used both for um, biosolids as well as, can, can you use the same plant essentially for biosolids and um, waste residues, say from farms, uh, invasive species, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Yeah, so the, um, the plan is according to ISO standards, these international standards, they're going to do like 51% minimum 
human waste, and then up to 49% um, green waste. Um, and so at the McKenna Resort, you know, uh, Jim has got like 11 acres and there's just a lot of green waste that otherwise he would have to pay to dispose of. And here's a great way to get rid of that and blend it. And then what he's talking about now with these bio, this, you know, super exciting biochar group that's all the top specialists across the country is now they can really talk about the exact mi mixtures and target those for certain contaminants. And that's what I think the EPA is excited about, especially when you talk about PFAS, PFAS, but then also just basic nutrients that they're trying to capture. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then is there any more questions online? All right. Well, let's, uh, even though they're not here, let's give them a big round of applause. Uh, Biomass. Jeff and Derek, we miss you. We wish you were here. Um, we have a number of people that are um, online. I just also want to give a shout out. Um, we have uh, Hudson Slay from the EPA, and then we have um, Kavika Winter from the, um, the NEAR program, uh, and Kanye Oipe, who's also part of the Cesspool Conversion Working Group and works at HIMB. Um, we have Ted Bolin, who's the assistant uh, attorney general who retired from DOH. And he really, he's on our advisory board and he helped with passage of a lot of these bills that really finally got rid of cesspools. So he, I personally owe him a great debt, uh, debt um, for helping with that. And then we have Rep Kaheli um, on the line as well, um, virtually. And now what we're gonna go into um, is really getting into regulation reforms. Um, and we're just gonna give you a brief overview of how we can streamline the process. And we've run these by uh, you know, DOH, um, working with Sina to really fast track, like we said, the, the need to do all these conversions. And, and Yoko's just done an amazing job of finding out what other states were doing. And we worked with a lot of engineers, including Dennis Poma in this room and others here to really figure out what needed to change first. Um, and how do we change those? And other states have great examples. So um, let's give it up for Yoko. All right. I like this mic better. Um, so yeah, like Stuart said, we discussed 10 regulation reforms for the code mostly of how individual wastewater systems are permitted, including cesspool replacements in Hawaii. Um, we collaborated with actually a lot of the folks in this room and on Zoom. So thank you all very much for contributing. And uh, the Department of Health Wastewater Branch took the time to review and put together responses for us. So thanks to them very much um, because we're all working together. Like Stuart said, this is a common project. Um, the private industry, academia, but also regulators, nonprofits, everybody has to pull on the same string to replace all these cesspools. And uh, you can find in your dark blue folders that are on your table an excerpt from these recommendations. Thanks, Raquel, for showing them. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. What I'm going to do is I'm going to announce sort of products of our conversation with the Department of Health about this. Now, I hope I don't misrepresent that. Um, the first uh, highlight I want to show you is uh, one of our recommendations of how the variance application system can be re revamped um, is actually something that the Department of Health is already working on. Really exciting the fact that currently variance applications have to be published in a newspaper, which takes some time and costs about a thousand dollars for a homeowner. Um, this will hopefully soon be um, instead posted on a centralized website most likely the Lieutenant Governor's website, uh, which will be a nice central location for everybody to view these applications. And uh, that's really timely because variance applications will be increasingly required for difficult sites, difficult projects with not a lot of space, high groundwater. So this is a really great time and, and we're thanking the DOH for working on this. Other um, recommendations we had based mostly on what other states are doing are how systems and homeowners can get credit or going the extra mile and making sure that their wastewater is either treated to a better standard or reduced 
um, and that we believe should be credited in making their leach field smaller um, so that it fits better in uh, smaller lots and that it's cheaper to install. And the first one of those is that we want to credit homeowners who replace all their flush toilets with no flush toilets, such as incineration toilets like Cinderella. In other states, uh, they allow the reduction of leach field sizes for this, and um, this saves money and space for homeowners and prevents over designs. Another one of those, we believe that if the gray water, meaning from such as uh, washing machines and showers is separated and treated separately and disposed of separately, this should allow a small black water system as well as smaller individual wastewater system. This gray water is most often then used for irrigation. And lastly, but not leastly, the National Sanitation Foundation has put out these standards we mentioned earlier. And if um, a, for example, an Elgin GSF, a Fuji Clean ATU, or a Rich Fleury's Biorector Garden that has these certifications, produces this cleaner water, the leach field has a much easier time of disposing it into the surrounding ground. And so the system should be allowed to be smaller. And we realize that this is not easy to implement, most of, uh, mostly because you have to be able to verify that these things are the case. And how do you verify? You inspect. However, the Department of Health right now doesn't have enough staff to do these inspections and that is something that should concern all of us, because if the systems aren't working, if tanks are failing, if flush toilets that are supposed to be replaced aren't replaced, then all of us suffer in the end. And so we believe that the support for the administrative bill that the Department of Health is going to be putting in for more funding, for more staff, should deserve all of our support. And so we will keep you updated on that and let you know how to support this together. And lastly, another great piece of news, um, the soil replacement mechanism, and I'm trying to go not too technical here, essentially soil replacement happens when the existing soil, if there is existing soil, percolates either too fast or too slow, and you bring in dirt that's kind of in the middle. And right now this happens on a case-by-case -case basis. The installer has to go the extra mile to find some dirt that might be the right percolation and test it. If it's not, you have to dig it back up. It's a whole mess. So. The project idea for collaboration between Bai and the Department of Health would be that Bai goes to each quarry on these islands, and there are a lot of them. We test the available soils that they have, test it for percolation rate, and publish the resulting list that all engineers, all installers can use it and make it easy, standardized, fast, and affordable. And this project will hopefully be funded by a grant. If you all have any ideas for somebody who might be interested in funding this, we have an open ear. And the Department of Health has assured us that they would give us written support for this type of project. So this is exciting to work on together. And I'll hand it back over to Stuart for the next part about policy recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Yoko. Um, Yoko really has done a great job in putting together these reforms. It took months and months and months, and it's a long list. So for those of you who are in this field, we'd really appreciate it if you could take a long, you know, a look at those. Um, because the legislative session is coming up. There's some going to, they're going to be internal rule changes at DOH, but there's some that are going to be policy. And that's what we're going to talk about now um, that, that we feel are just essential for the state to move forward on this issue. Um, and just kind of as an overview, um, this is what we went back to. We um, talked about the, um, you know, in 2016, that was when we made our first big move, the ban in the construction of new cesspools. Um, and that also created the $10,000 tax break for homeowners to upgrade their systems. Unfortunately, that was supposed to be modeled after the solar um, tax credits. And so it was supposed to be for companies to be able to pool together those tax breaks so that they could help fund and work with homeowners to do those conversions um, and take care of all the paperwork. Um, they found that individual homeowners, the way they passed it, don't have an appetite, don't even know how to take advantage of that. So it did not work well. Um, and I think on that way, they're a little burned and they're like, we don't want to do this again, but it's like, it was done the wrong way. If we do it the right way, if we incentivize businesses, we can really start to make a lot of progress. Um, then we passed Act 125, um, which up mandated the upgrade of all cesspools by 2050, required UH to do this upgrade priority report, um, which was done, but we're still um, evolving that. And then Act 132 created the Cesspool Conversion Working Group, which I serve on, 
would love feedback from you all. Um, you know, we need to, this is the year that we're rolling out our recommendations. Um, and Roger Babcock has been really instrumental, has helped put together some of the reports. Um, and then uh, folks at Corolo have also been working on that in engineering. Um, and then now we're gonna talk about some of the bills that we still need to pass and that we've been working on for the last few years. The most important bill, um, and, and Chris, I'd love to get your you know, input on this, is um, we work with Representative Lowen and Senator Gabbard um, and many others is we need a mandatory inspection of the IWS systems upon point of sale of a property. And we call this the Home Purchase Protection Plan because right now the only tool of enforcement that DOH has to say that you have to convert your cesspool is if you do you know, a major renovation to your home. Um, if we had had this in place, can you imagine over the last two years during the pandemic when home sales went through the roof, when there was so much money floating and people were paying cash and over the, sell the listing price, if we had passed this two years ago and we came so close, we could have had hundreds and hundreds of cesspools already converted to much better systems, improving our water quality. So this is our top priority. It has to pass next year because it's just so logical. We need this. And some realtors have said, we're working with a group of realtors and Jackie, um, our new assistant, who's been you know, working on this, um, it comes from a real estate background. And she says, yeah, there's a lot of support among real estate agents because on the big island, we received some really angry letters from homeowners who spent every bit of money they had on their home. And when then they went to renovate it, they found out they'd have to spend, you know, anywhere from $25 to $50,000 converting their cesspool. And they were pissed, frankly. They were like, we don't have the money to do this. And they were angry at their real estate agents. So what we're trying to tell the real estate lobby is like, this is a form of self-protection. You know, this is a way to decrease your liability because you don't want people angry at you, um, homeowners that are doing these things. And so um, that's our top priority right now. And we want you guys to discuss this in groups. And then we have to find out some way to finance these because um, homeowners just don't have this and they're not gonna be ready to go out and take a, you know, a, a, you know, a mortgage um, uh, or a refi uh, to, to do this. But um, thank you, Eric. Yeah. Aloha. Um, so we're, we're looking at something, again, based on the solar model of PACE, property assessed clean energy, and we want to do property assessed accessible conversion, um, and we can work with the state and the counties to say, you know, it's attached to the house. So even if you sell your house, that loan still needs to be paid off that paid for the conversion. Um, it's just kind of a common sense way, but we have people in this audience that are much, much more financially savvy than I am, um, and that we need your help on and how to structure that, people with policy backgrounds. Finally, this is the one that people have a hard time with. We need a cesspool fee and subsidy. Right now, the biggest polluters are the people with cesspools, but ironically, they don't pay any money. People who pay sewer fees and pay lots of money to upgrade their individual wastewater systems pay lots of money, but they're not contributing to the problem. So we've got this upside down world and you know there's no penalty there's no cost so they're like why would i convert my cesspool so we have to associate a cost with that and if we started as low as ten dollars a month which as you know is a fraction of what most people pay on sewer um and we had a hundred thousand people contributing to that who are on cesspools we could have you know millions of dollars that would be dedicated to help low-income people convert their cesspools who would otherwise have no way of doing that um, and so that's something that we really feel like this is a groundwater and coral reef protection fund. It's got to be, the money's got to be set just for that. Um, and you just add a small price and maybe you slowly up it as we move to 2050. So people start to feel more and more of the pain and they are incentivized to convert. Um, and then there's money that they put in the system that could help them do that. So it is a kind of a win-win for everyone. Um, and that's uh, kind of the overview of those three policies that we think are going to be really key for the next legislative session. Um, 
And so, you know, as we've talked about before, with the 2050 deadline, we need to do be doing about 3,000 cesspools a year. We're doing about 150 to 200 right now. Uh, we need to avoid those bottlenecks and address the really serious water quality issues. And uh, Christina is working with some of the top researchers in the state um, to really document those and with, DA, with DARS 30 by 30 program. And so what we wanna ask you, you know, at the tables is we can focus on, depending on what your table wants to do, we can focus on policy, finance, um, or, um, you know, Christine is gonna give you a little bit of a quick overview about the financing options, but we're gonna break up into these different categories um, that we want you to look at um, during the round table, and then we'll report out after that. Um, so I'll pass it to Christina now to give you an overview of finance. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna preface this with saying that um, for Yoko's presentation, he's, he's a great wastewater engineer and Stuart's been working for years in policy. I'm an oceanographer, so this is a little bit more of like ideas about financing. Uh, I'm still learning a lot about uh, potential financing mechanisms. Um, so I am, yeah, just been curious to hear your guys' feedback and hear any ideas that folks in the audience have about financing options. Um, so here are some of the ways that we've been looking into at FI um, to attempt to uh, help homeowners finance their accessible conversions. Um, one of the mechanisms that's available is the USDA Rural Development Grant and Loan Programs. These are the 502 and 504 loans. Um, they are mostly loans and only um, a small percentage of them are grants, and we do want to find ways to get more grant funding. But the loans are low interest and they're available for those in rural areas, which is most of the state um, outside of the um, Honolulu metro area. And um, they're also um, subject to some pretty low thresholds in terms of property values, um, at least for Hawaii, where we have really high property values, even if you live in a modest home, um, land values are really high. So it is limited um, to who's eligible, but that is definitely an existing program that can help homeowners finance at a low interest rate. Uh, we've also been looking into current um, congressionally directed uh, spend, uh, uh, sorry, congressionally directed spending, um, looking at things like uh, federal appropriations um, to su support some programs. Um, there's also some, a couple of big infrastructure bills that are being considered right now, and we've been talking to our representatives and trying to encourage them to uh, direct funding towards these individual wastewater systems and converting the cesspools. Um, We've talked a little bit earlier about the uh, Clean Water State Revolving Fund, the SRF, and I believe that's a mechanism that in Hawaii that we could be using more. I think that there's a DOH has said that there's a lot of available funding that um, you know could be used, and um, basically we need to help the counties um, basically encourage them to use that SRF funding to um, address some larger wastewater projects and. That could be in the form of um, smaller wastewater treatment plants, repairs to existing wastewater treatment plants and sewer lines, and then um, maybe a little bit more on the innovative side is uh, working on these decentralized systems and individual systems. And then as Stuart mentioned, uh, we're also talking about uh, something like a cesspool fee and pulling that into a fund to help low-income homeowners with their conversions. As we start financing and getting these cesspool conversions moving, um, there's also a need for increased workforce and increased training. Um, so we're part of the Work for Water Initiative, which um, probably many of you in this room have heard of before. Um, this is a collaboration between uh, University of Hawaii Community Colleges, the Sea Grant Program, the Water Resources Research Center, all out of UH, as well as the um, State, uh, Hawaii State Department of Health and um, our organization, VI. Um, so this program would basically include training pathways and job training pathways to encourage, um, in, encourage the wastewater sector to grow. Um, this would be, as I said, in partnership with the Hawaii Community Colleges. And we're also uh, partnering with the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. And this is a great way to both um, on a practical level access federal funding because Hawaiian homelands are under federal jurisdiction and can, we can potentially directly um, get funding from the federal level 
to work on conversions in Hawaiian homelands. And then also it would, it's uh, great from an environmental justice perspective because cesspool issues with nearshore water pollution disproportionately affect the Hawaiian community. And it would be, um, I think, really ideal to help Hawaiian homeowners um, early on in this process. And um, finally, for this Work for Water initiative, we are actively seeking federal funding um, and also uh, looking for grants and lots of different pathways to try to, fill, um, try to fund this workforce development program. And last on the uh, financial side of things, I just wanna share a little bit about what we learned from Stony Brook University when we recently visited them as part of our um, uh, cohort activities with the Decentralized Wastewater Innovations Group. So Stony Brook has really uh, found that it's hugely important to have economic incentives to convert cesspools. So they've been able to um, pool a combination of state and county grants um, to individual homeowners. So they can do something like $10,000 from the state, $10,000 from the county, and then a few $5,000 grants that people are eligible for depending on their income, where they live in a priority area, what type of system they're using, special sand filters, that kind of thing. So uh, folks can kind of piece together the grant funding that they need to be able to convert. And then the next question is, where does all that funding come from? And what we learned when we visited them was that they really have a diversified um, kind of funding portfolio to help people with the conversions. So this includes um, a local sales tax in Suffolk County, just in the county. That's a 0.25% sales tax that goes directly to a water quality fund. And that helps uh, fund these conversions. There's also um, the kind of federal pot to the state, to the county, um, that kind of funding pathway. Um, specifically, the Clean Water Infrastructure Act of 2017 um, has 15 million per year to New York State. And because Suffolk County has the highest number of cesspools and a really, really effective program, um, they're actually getting about $10 million per year of that state funding to address this high priority area. So, um, so they have a consistent funding through that program as well. Uh, they were they also took advantage of FEMA funding after Hurricane Sandy, and they have really uh, documented their nitrogen pollution problem really thoroughly, traced it um, using isotopes and really specific tracing pathways so that they know that the nitrogen pollution in their water sources is coming directly from uh, cesspool leaching and uh, human derived wastewater sources. So since they they know that. Um, they can do, uh, basically use these nitrogen pollution thresholds uh, to, uh, to get some funding as well. And finally, at the community level, they have some loans available through a community development corporation. So I'm just kind of tossing all of those ideas out there as some ideas of diversified funding sources that we may be able to mimic or um, kind of get some inspiration from to figure out how to fund these conversions for Hawaii. So, um, that's it for our kind of intro to those those topics. And at this point, we're going to be breaking out into some groups for discussion. Um, on Zoom, we'll be sending you guys to some breakout rooms. Um, and make sure you open the, the document that's in the, um, in the chat. That'll have the questions, uh, the discussion, discussion questions. So we'll have about online. Uh online folks i sound australian online um and uh thanks for sticking with us and sorry you couldn't be here in person uh we really appreciate you staying on we have uh folks uh in person here from the department of hawaiian homelands we also have nancy who we've been working with um mcpherson from dhhl uh and so this is an exciting new partnership and uh we think we can get federal funding to help uh, those folks which is exciting um, so, you know, I, it's, it's fascinating to hear your input because these are, you know, people in the room today are really, um, some of, some of you are like top of your field and, and, and most of you are involved in this, whether it's directly or peripherally, and we're all involved in this issue. There's no escaping it because whether you're on sewer and you're like, oh, I don't have to deal with this, where you go swimming Throughout the island, there are places that are not. And so it affects every one of us. And when we're talking about drinking water, that's our bottom line. That's the most important thing. And that's why we're named by because it comes down to, to water. Um, 
And, but the Hawaiian word for wealth, vai vai, if we do this right, if we use these market, market mechanisms um, and find ways to grow businesses locally here and hire more people, we can do this. Um, you know, the two tables in the back were both mentioning the storm water fee that's moving forward. Sherry had mentioned that um, and, and Roger had talked about it. This is something that they, the county, uh, city and county of Honolulu has been working on for a while. Um, now's the time to see if we can tie that in with wastewater because you can't separate them, right? If you have stormwater runoff, you have wastewater runoff from all these cesspools. Um, and I'm really excited about the idea. You know, it's so fascinating that we have a state senator with Chris Lee, who's been working on this issue for a number of years, um, and Kelly King from the county council, you know, and he was saying, like the stormwater bill that we helped pass, we passed a law that my friend Roth wrote that you had to enable the counties to charge the stormwater fees. So we passed a state bill to allow that to happen because people sued in Maryland said, you can't charge us these fees. You don't have the prerogative. You don't have the power to do that. And so this might be a model that we can use where the state says, yes, you can do this. You should do this. Empowers the state. They have more of the collection organism, whether it's the collection body, whether it's through the Board of Water Supply, or what else did we say? Property taxes, taxes um, to do it through that. So something that there's some enforcement mechanism. Um, as Roger said, you know, if you don't pay your water bill, you don't get water and that makes people pay. You have very high rates of return on people paying their bills. Um, so this is just the beginning of the conversation today. Um, I, we hope all of you will stay here and um, we have great food and drinks, and this is the fun part where we get to network and talk. Um, but let's keep this conversation going. Um, there are a number of people we talked to today that anytime you want to set up uh, a meeting, a Zoom meeting, we're always available. We like to think that we are getting people out of their silos and getting people meeting together from all different fields. And when you look around, the level of expertise and knowledge in this room is incredible. Um, so let's all commit to keep it going because it's a major problem from the state and we can make progress. And the good thing is with the current administration, infrastructure is the single word that echoes out the most uh, from their priorities, as well as you know, environmental and social justice issues. And this is these are linked to this issue. Um, and so I think through business, and through federal uh, money, we have a lot of potential coming down and a lot of attention being paid to this issue. Um, before we uh, break, I just want to say a huge mahalo um, to Bill uh, and Lewis um, at Cambrian. You know, Bill traveled all the way from Boston, so we appreciate that. Um, and then we have, you know, uh, Dennis and Richard from Fuji Clean. Um, they've been great partners. They sponsored us today. Um, the folks from Elgin, Ridge to Reefs, Paul and Kelly also traveled from the East Coast, and we really appreciate that. Um, so let's give them a quick round of applause. And while we're thanking everybody, if you want to grab, um, if you want the quinoa bar, which I highly recommend, there are things on your table. If you just fill that out, they will bring it to you. The stuff in the back. The um, captain will come to the table. Um, and and uh, if you can raise your hand in the back again, yes. Um, she will come and uh, we'll do it table by table. And, um, but make sure we take advantage of the quinoa bar and eat and drink because we've got lots of food because we're under um, our original numbers. So I also want to thank our sponsors, um, Jim Mothersbaugh from Water Tectonics, who flew in from Washington and has been just a great partner and uh, Dennis at ACSI, Pacific Current, Scott and Justin have been great partners as well. And we really appreciate, they bring such financial expertise um, and legal expertise. So let's give it up for our sponsors as well. And then we have our funders from, you know, our, our large donors. Um, so Amy uh, Hennessy, who's online today from Ulupono, wanna thank them for the support of this. 
And also for the lovely books, the journals, don't forget to take those home and the pens. Um, and Amy's just been a friend for a long time and Udupono is doing great work with issues like these. Um, and then Eric, who had to leave a little early at Castle Foundation. Castle was one of our original backers. I want to thank them, as well as the folks at the Midyar um, Family Foundation. Um, finally, uh, I really want to thank, we have the most amazing team. I want to thank uh, Raquel, who helped organize this whole thing. And we appreciate that. Um, we're going to miss you, and we appreciate all the work. Um, but we're glad you could help train and bring in Jackie, who's going to do a great job as well, um, to, uh, to our volunteers um, who just did a great job. Allie and Joel both worked for us this summer doing internships. Joel's a legal scholar, gave us some great um, reports, and we appreciate it. Allie did some great work with Christina doing water quality work as well. Um, John Anner, who unfortunately had to run, he's got to catch a plane or his wife was going to kill him. Their anniversary is tomorrow, so he has to be uh, back there for that. Um, and then uh, finally, I just really want to give a big shout out to um, Yoko, our wastewater engineer, and to Christina. I could not ask to work with better people, so let's give them a big round of applause for all their great work. And then the final, final thing is all of you, in the face of everything that's going on, the craziness and the rise of the Delta variant, we have served all the protocols, and we just appreciate you taking the time and effort to come out, to be responsible, and to contribute and just share your kuleana with us and, and our kuleana, collective kuleana to help solve this problem. So mahalo to all of you and then let's have a drink and make some toast and eat some food. Mahalo. Woo.